Hello again, welcome back to Develop Gaming Games with Construct 2. I'm Shahed. And James. So we're going to continue with Module 3 out of the four modules. In this particular module, we're going to talk about exploring Construct 2 templates. Now, as you've seen earlier, Construct 2 comes with a lot of different templates. When you start the software, you can click on Project or File New and start off with a new project. And every time you start a new project, you'll be able to select an existing template or you can start creating something from scratch. So. Let's take a look at the next slide here. Uh, we're gonna talk about inspecting and modifying a template. So we'll start off with inspecting the existing templates that exist, uh, and also we'll look at how we can modify these templates. Uh, a good way to modify them is to take a look at what's being done and see if you can reverse engineer uh, the different parts that are already in there. And maybe you can take your experience and uh, learn about how you can add new things to the game. So we're gonna open up Construct 2 here. So if we take a look at our desktop, we will take a look at uh, the Flapping Bird template that uh, we have open. So let's move over to that. And while you're getting that going, I'll just kind of add to, to what we're talking about. These templates that we have, um, there's some, there's a couple that I've created, there's some that come from Construct 2, yep. but they're just a great way to get started and not really have to redo all the code that's already been done for you. Yep. So it gives you a good starting point, you can get going, make some modifications, which uh, we'll show you how to do and get going quicker and easier than it would be to start from scratch like we were doing earlier. Right, and this is one of the ones that we're gonna look at. So as we uh, looked at in the earlier modules, uh, we have multiple layouts and different event sheets that are attached to them. This particular template actually comes with Construct 2. And the way to get to it, if you click File, New, you'll notice that earlier it started with an empty project or some existing project. Uh, you can scroll down the list and look for this uh, so-called Flapping Bird template that Construct 2 comes with or you can search for flapping in this case and select it. So that's how you'd get something like this. Uh, we'll also take a look at how you can modify this to create your own version. So as we get back to our uh, presentation, we'll take a look at what else you can do with it. So basically the game templates we're gonna talk about today are uh, the Flapping Bird template from which we'll build our own game called Gallant Glider. And then we'll go on to an infinite runner and we'll look at an example called Ninja Cat Runner. You see a couple of sprites here which show the different frames of the Ninja Cat character and you see he's running around. Uh, this is used to modify the existing Infinite Runner template. So next up we have an Infinite Jumper, uh, similar to the Doodle Jump type game that we looked at earlier where you're jumping upwards. Uh, in this case the uh, screen is always moving, the platforms are always coming down at you. We'll take a look at how the same Ninja Cat character can be used to jump upwards as well. And finally we'll wrap up with a couple of templates that uh, James here actually came up with. Uh, one is your trivia template, and uh, finally, a generic game template. Uh, this allows us to build uh, any game. So can you tell us a little bit about the gen generic game template? Yeah, actually, we probably should have uh, mentioned the generic game template first because that's really the base for the trivia template. But yep. some of the stuff we did earlier with having the page nav navigation with the, the start page, the game page, the end page, and how those uh, keep high scores and stuff like that is all kind of built into the generic game template that I created just as a kind of a head start that takes care of some of that stuff for you. And then the trivia template is basically built on top of that generic game template. So the trivia template um, adds some logic to read in a file with trivia questions and handles all the answering and stuff in the game section of the template. So it, it uh, gives you a head start just like all these templates do yep. and lets you get going a little bit faster. Right, so the key thing here is to not only give you a head start, but also reduce the amount of time you'll reuse uh, to duplicate the work you've already done. So let's say you could build everything from scratch where you have to redo things you've already done, or you could use some of the existing templates, and you can also build your own templates and build upon that. So with that, let's take a look at the next slide, uh, inspecting and modifying a template. So here, uh, I talk about inspecting a template. So what are the two things we're, we're gonna look at? So earlier we talked about our layouts being the screens that are part of the game, and uh, the event sheets that are part of the behavior and logic of the game. So in this case, uh, let's take a look at the different layouts for one of these uh, games. So the layout here on the right, as you can see the projects uh, tab, uh, the projects panel shows you a start layout and a game layout. And the way you can see uh, what event sheets are attached to is any particular one that's selected shows the properties panel. So as we saw during James's demos, the event sheet shows you what it's attached to. Now every time you try to create a new layout, you'll notice it asks you whether you want to add a new event sheet or not. 
So when, it, when you add an event sheet, uh, it automatically attaches it to the layout you just created. And if you don't add an event sheet, it creates a layout by itself, and you can uh, choose to add a different event sheet at a later time. And one thing, one thing we did a little differently earlier was instead of just creating a new layout, I was duplicating an existing layout, so it actually didn't ask me if I wanted an event sheet. I had to go in manually do that, right. which is why what we did earlier seems a little different than what you're doing now. Yep, and there, again, there's many ways of doing things in Contract 2. Uh, choose uh, to do what you think is best for you, and uh, do take a look at what others have done, so that way you can figure out whether it's easier for you or not. Um, so on to the event sheets. The event sheets that we see over here for this template, you can see that there's uh, the first column, the second column, the third column. We touched on these before, where the first column shows the object on which the event is acting on. The second one shows the actual event that occurs. And finally, uh, we have um, the action that we can add. So one thing to recognize here is that an add action uh, link appears under the existing actions. That means that when an action is added uh, to a condition, you can add additional actions to it. So when this condition is true, these actions happen in sequence. So if I add another action here, after the first action happens, the second one happens after that. To add a sub-event, as we've seen earlier, we can right-click on any of the existing conditions and add sub events or add another condition. And again, as we mentioned earlier, this is akin to having multiple if-else logic blocks. So when you pick apart one of these templates, take a look at how these are done. Um, this one is very simple. It, it's only got two simple events. But the game events tab over here shows you a series of events. So as we go deeper into this particular template, we're going to find out uh, how it all works. Uh, so with that, let's take a look at uh, what the next item is on the list. Um, next, to figure out how to edit the existing events that are already there. So let's say we open up a template. There's a whole bunch of events that are there. You want to figure out how you can replace something without having to redo it. So one way to do that is to right click on existing uh, uh, action. And you can say, add another action, or you can replace an action as well. You can also replace the object that the action acts upon. So right now, if you have a graphic that's here and you want to replace that object, you'll notice that it gives me another choice to add a different graphic. So here you're actually limited to something that's interchangeable with the object that's already selected. So you can't just replace uh, a tiled background with the system object, but you can add, uh, replace one tiled background with another tiled background, something that's equivalent. So it's actually a, a new thing for me. I didn't realize that, because I would always have to go back, back, back to get to the object, and then go back forward to select uh, the action for, for, the, uh, for the object. But it's a good point, because not only are you, are you taking what they have, but you want to change and customize for your feel and, and your game, right? Yep. You want it <clears throat> excuse me, to, to be exactly what you want it to be, and you, and you want to take whatever you can leverage and just kind of change that and customize it to fit your game. Right. Uh, so again, uh, make sure you try out um, th things that are available in the system, but also look at what other people are doing. So with that, let's take a look at uh, what's up next. So I, know I have an, a bullet point over here that says objects, uh, properties, and layers. So what does that mean? It means that for every object that's selected, it has properties uh, that you can view and edit. It also has different layers uh, that it can belong to. So if you take a look at our game layout, in this case, there's a bird sitting on the screen. By clicking on the bird, either from the main uh, game screen or from the side panel here, we see that the property panel has changed. So in the properties panel, we can change uh, things like the behaviors and other things that are already here. Uh, we can also check to see what layer it's on. So in this case, I only have one layer in this game, but if you had multiple layers, you could change the layer of something after having added it. So when I right click here and say, insert new object, I'm adding something, it automatically gets added to the layer that's currently selected. So in the layers tab, you'll notice there's that one layer. But in some of the examples we'll see today, you'll notice that there's multiple layers in some games. And uh, you can choose to add to a layer by having it pre-selected. And you can also change the layer for any object simply by selecting it and then changing the layer. Yep, and we, and we saw that earlier in both demos. We had different layers. In the first one we had, in the Ghost Shooter, we had a layer for background, for yep. game, and for the heads of display. And then we had a similar thing in the, uh, the Golden Ball demo where we had a background basically and then the foreground was the game. Yep. So yeah, so don't worry about making mistakes. Uh, once in a while you'll notice that you do things that you may not intend to do. Uh, but you can always go back and change things around. Uh, and the shortcuts really help here. So if you hit Control-Z at any time, it'll undo most things. Uh, and by most, I mean sometimes you might 
move something around or change something that you may not have intended to do, may not undo. But for the most part, uh, moving a position of an object or adding a new event, uh, changing those actions that you see on the screen, uh, those can easily be undone. Con control Z should definitely be your friend. <laughs> yeah. during also the control S. So control S for saving yep. and control Z for undoing. All right, so with that, um, what about um, modifying the template before you publish? So right now we looked at an existing uh, Flappy Bear template that Constructor comes with. Uh, if you want, you could publish that as is, but you know, it is obviously just a clone and a template that's available for learning. Uh, the best way to publish something is to make it unique, make it your own. Uh, so as we have seen in my version uh, of uh, the screen that you can see here, it says Gallant Glider. Uh, it's about a hang glider who literally flies through uh, the air and he tries to avoid obstacles. Again, very similar to the so-called Flapping Bird clone that we've been using, which is in itself a clone of the popular Flappy Bird game. Um, all I did was I replaced all, all the backgrounds and graphics in the game and changed some behaviors so that it also tracks a high score. Yeah, it's a great example of how you can start with one of those templates, the Flapping Bird template. Change a few things, customize it, really make it your own, and it looks like a very it, a different game. It looks like its own game completely. Yep. So it's an awesome... Awesome way to get started and do your own thing. Yep. Uh, and the second part here, as you see in the next slide here, uh, for modifying a template, your game also might have sound effects and background music. I don't have those in my particular game, but uh, that's something you could add in. You could add a sound effect uh, for when the person or character jumps up, when they uh, fall out of the screen or when something happens to indicate some sort of feedback to the user. Uh, again, just as we had added some invisible objects, let's just mouse, keyboard, browser, uh, and other uh, invisible objects where, which the game uses, we can also add an audio object, and we'll see how to do that as well. Yep. And just to kind of add on, we're starting with these templates, but that doesn't limit you to anything. Yep. You can take the template, and you can just take whatever you want and delete the rest of it and kind of change it. So you don't even have to follow the majority of what's there. It's just a starting point, and you can change whatever you want. Yep. Uh, so here, uh, I have a little note down here on my slide. It says it's pretty important to attribute the original author as appropriate. And the reason you do that is because sometimes you'll find free things on the internet, uh, but there might be some rules on how you can share and redistribute that material. Uh, so today, as I mentioned earlier, we're using the Ghost Shooter template and now uh, the Flappy Bird tutorial that we're building upon. And again, we'd like to thank the folks at Sarah for providing some tutorials for, for us. And we also have links towards the end uh, so you can find out uh, how to uh, find those tutorials. And Shahed, I don't think we've talked about this yet, but where, where do you go to get your graphics? Where did you get your graphics that you ended up using? Uh, so for my particular graphics, I did some uh, web searches and looked around for uh, graphics that are free. And again, I looked on uh, many different websites to make sure that they are freely available. Uh, I modified them a little, changed the colors and so on. Gotcha. Uh, the background itself is a modified version of the sky that ships with the Flapping Bird template. Uh, again, uh, sometimes you can modify existing uh, free graphics so that you don't have to build them from scratch. Uh, that's how I ended up with this. Again, very simple, uh, but it's functional. Yep, so that's graphics is where I struggle. So building something from scratch is a big struggle for me. So being able to find something online and kind of go from there and use that is a really big plus. Yep. Uh, so with that, let's dive into our game templates. Uh, you've already seen one of the game templates that we started out with, which was the uh, popular Flappy Bird clone that we're looking at. And uh, from that, we're going to go into uh, the Gallant Glider version of it. So I have a couple of windows open here. So let's take a look at this. So earlier when I'd shown this to you, you took a look at uh, what the layout looks like. Let's break it down a little. So for this particular layout, we'll notice that we have some pipes on the screen and that we have a background and we have some tiled background at the bottom. Now, when I run this game, you'll notice that the browser pops up and the game is immediately playable but now it flips back to the title screen. The reason it does that is because the Run Layout button by default loads the current layout that's in display, uh, but you really want the game to start off with the Start uh, Layout. So let's click on Run Layout from here, and you'll notice that the game pops up with the uh, Play button and the Start screen. Now, how do you make sure that your game starts from this particular screen? The way you do that is if you go up to your project, uh, all the way up on the Project panel, you'll notice that uh, there is actually a first layout defined. So by default, it defaults to whatever layout you have at the beginning, which is your start layout. Uh, but you can also choose something uh, for a particular one to start. Uh, now, I know Run Layout launches only the currently viewed layout, but when you set the first layout after you export or publish the game, that's when the first layout kicks in. That that's way, a, that's a good thing to make sure that you do right. Yep. Because if you if you publish a game and it doesn't go to the right screen, then it gets kind of awkward, right? So you want to exactly. make sure that that you set that first layout 
to the one that you know will be the, the first layout you want the user to go to. Yep, and that's a great point because uh, I could go ahead and run my game and debug it and run it all, all the time uh, from the start layout. But when I publish the game, if I forget to uh, make sure this is the first one or that uh, the start layout is selected, it's not going to work. Right. Yep. Uh, so with that, let's take a look at the events. So start events is the event sheet for the start layout. And how do we know that? It's because if we take a look at the start layout, click it on the right, we'll notice that the event sheet is called start events. So with that, let's open up the start events event That's sheet. That's another thing about naming. When you mm -hmm. name things appropriately, uh, yes, you can go back and double check, but you kind of know the start layout is associated with the start event sheet because you name things appropriately. So, so the more descriptive you can be with your naming, the better off it is for you to read, and then especially if it's a template for other people to read and be able to use as well. Exactly. So when you start off, you can have uh, one or two event sheets, one or two layouts. Maybe they're called event sheet one and event sheet two. Uh, but when you start, once you start cleaning up your project, it's best to have something more descriptive. Uh, so here we have two simple events which we saw earlier, and let's figure out what these do. So the play button can be clicked to launch the game. So this is very simple. As we saw earlier, James had added some events to his previous games. Uh, to add button play, you would normally go to add event, and you'll notice there are some uh, uh, buttons that are already added here. And if I clicked on that, that would have multiple conditions. And here you see an on-clicked event, and you'll notice for the most part, what you see in the event sheet is actually being displayed uh, in the list of things you can click on as well. So if I select on-click, um, this one appears to be similar to that. So as we go through some of the other examples, you'll notice that what you uh, select from is different from uh, what you're uh, seeing visibly. That's because there's multiple conditions, there's parameters, things you can add in, and uh, the final result looks a little different. And we'll get into a little bit more detail, uh, but let's look at how this system go to game was added. So as we learned in the previous example, uh, if you click add action, you can choose uh, this intangible object called system, where you can add abstract things like uh, that are not attached to a particular game object. And here we can do go to. And you'll notice there's multiple go to options. There's one that says go to layout, where you can select from a list of layouts. One is go to layout by name, where you have to explicitly type in the layout name. And finally, you can have go to next or previous layout. So let's focus on the first two. So if you do go to layout and click next, you'll notice that I can choose from start or game. In this case, I can choose game. And I'm done. It looks identical to what I have up there. Uh, what if I had chosen the other one? So let's say. I replace this action, and I choose System, and I say Go To, and I choose Layout by Name. So now I'm provided with this uh, double quotes where I have to type in Game. So both of these will work. In one case, you have to remember what the correct name is and type it, and the other one you can just select it from the list. I prefer selecting it from the list, but again, both examples work. Yeah, you would, you're more prone to typing errors when you have to manually type in the name versus just choosing from a list. So I would, I would recommend going by the list that they give you. Yep. Uh, so now we have uh, a duplicate of this, obviously showing this as an example. Uh, you can undo by clicking Control Z on the keyboard. There's also up here, uh, if I can draw a little circle, an undo and redo button on the top. Uh, that also helps you go back and forth. So I'm just going to hit undo on my keyboard by hitting Control Z, and you notice that it's slowly disappearing. So now let's take a look at the second button there. Again, it's very similar. Uh, I've just showed you how to click on uh, unclicked and add that as an event. In this case, the browser object is very similar to how James had added links to uh, the Twitter page and the other web page as well. Uh, so again, I won't go through this uh, particular step again. I'll jump right into the game events. So this may look a little intimidating at the beginning, but one thing you'll notice is that some of these have uh, large bold text, which I'm going to collapse. So these are called groups. So the way these groups are set in each of these templates is uh, they're organized so that things are logically grouped together and you can easily collapse and expand them. So they don't affect the actual performance and functionality of the game, but it's a great way to figure out how these templates work. And this, this goes back to the, to the readability for people who are going to use something that you create later on, or maybe you create it and then you go back later and look at what you did and maybe you get a little confused. The more organized you are, the better it is for people to read, to go back and understand what you did. Yep. And the more experience you have with kind of architecting these Construct 2 projects, the better you'll get at organizing them and making them the, the most readable and, and best way possible. So, yep. uh, so now we have, um, uh, at the bottom of the screen, we'll have the ability to right-click and add additional things. So you notice there's an Add Event link at all times where you can click on and add new things. You can right-click and add event. But when you right-click, you do have options for comments, groups, and global variables. 
Now, these are, uh, this is the way the groups are added. Uh, if you click Add Group, and I can say My Group of Things, or whatever else you want to call it, and click OK, and that adds a group. And if you add an event within that, it adds the uh, events right underneath it. So again, that's a way to add these groups, as you can see, exists in this template. Uh, so let's go into each of these. So at the very top, we have some global constants. We've already seen earlier how we can create uh, global variables, but you'll notice that some of these are constants and some of these are not. Uh, and just to recap, when you right click in a blank area and then add a global variable, this is what the screen looks like. And there is a checkbox for constants. So you check it when you do want constants and uh, you basically uncheck it when you don't. So obviously the score needs to be a variable that can change as you're making more points. Or else uh, you don't really get the success or the reward for your success. Exactly, you'd always have a score of zero. Uh, so let's jump through each of these one by one. Uh, so on start of layout, we want certain things to happen. There is some initialization going on where the score text is being set. Uh, you'll notice something cryptic here that says the web font is being set. This is completely optional. Uh, you don't have to set a web font, but default it does pick up whatever font is available. Uh, but if you wish to set a font, um, it is available for uh, your text box. And also these backgrounds that are moving quickly uh, in the game when you saw, when I was running the game earlier, you may have seen that the background only exists once in the layout, but it keeps rushing towards you very quickly. So when the game starts, it makes sure that the layouts are uh, aligned correctly with the backgrounds. And also uh, the initial pipes are destroyed and the bird is aligned. So what does it mean for the initial pipes to be destroyed? That's because when we look at our game layout, there's two pipes out there and we're auto-generating a lot of pipes that are gonna come towards you. We want to make sure that these two pipes don't intersect with the auto-generated pipes, otherwise they're going to overlap. Uh, so we'll take a look at the template further down to show you what that means. Next, we move on to the movement part. This is really small, so the touch actually takes care of the click, and I believe we talked about that earlier as well. This is really important to note because if you just add a mouse click, that won't handle any touch events, but if you handle touch events, it'll take care of clicks and it will take care of the mouse clicks uh, in addition to your touch events. Yeah, so that's, that's really the best way to go with the, the mobile stuff that we're doing because we're talking about phones and tablets and touchscreen yep. laptops and big touchscreen monitors like this where you have to be able to support both if you want to get all the users that are out there. Right. Uh, so over here what we're saying is that on touch, uh, the bird uh, uh, sets an angle to a certain number of degrees and it jumps upwards. Now, if you recall, we talked about the coordinate system where Y goes down. So adding a negative jump strength uh, going upwards uh, makes a bird jump up when it starts out. Now, there's also an angle set, uh, set value for 320 degrees. Uh, it starts off at a horizontal plane and it goes uh, in a circle, if you can imagine a circle that is uh, counterclockwise. And uh, so 90 degrees would be towards the bottom and 320 is uh, all the way around almost to 360 degrees. So, the way that's set, uh, if you recall I mentioned earlier, sometimes when you look at it, you don't know how this was set. So if I add a new action, I'll show you how that works. So if I had selected bird as an action, uh, you'll notice it says set platform vector Y. So if I start typing in set platform vector Y, you'll see there's nothing there. So what if I just say set, and I scroll down to see what the platform section is. You'll notice there's something called set vector Y. So when I select that, it's basically setting the Y vector for the platform behavior. So that's where their name comes from. So in case you can't find uh, the name uh, exactly as it appears, start typing it slowly and just scroll up and down to see if you can find it. And once you know what it is, now you know better and you can type in set vector Y. Because that way I can select set vector Y. And here the value is being set to negative jump strength. I could have set it to a negative integer value or I could just type in jump strength. You'll notice that that's one of the constants I had added above and I can select it and I can click done, and that looks exactly like this value up here. So I'm gonna undo that. So I'll be doing this a lot. We'll look at the template. We'll see how to recreate some of these, and if we've already covered it, I'll just mention it in passing. Uh, set angle should be pretty easy. If I add action for the bird and type in set angle, you'll notice there is an option that says set angle. And if I select that, I can actually type in 320, and that's what creates this. So let's undo that. So what that does is make sure that every time you touch it, the bird rotates just a little. So let's actually run that, see what it looks like. So see how the bird is, every time I click on the screen, it's sort of rotating just a little. So that's and what And when that he's means. falling, he's rotating a little bit to face downward. Yep. Which is, I think, the next step that you'll get to. Yep, so 
there's another system here, uh, system every tick action. So we talked about a tick is not really a second. It happens several times a second. In this case, it could be 60 frames a second. Uh, so let's not worry about how many times per second. If you just want something to be done at all times, uh, make sure that you use system every tick. So it just happens very frequently. So in this case, I've said rotate 60 times. There's something called DT over here. So this one's a little tricky. Uh, first, I'll show you how to add something like rotate. So when I chose bird and I said rotate, and the key thing to uh, notice here is there's the word rotate and the word clockwise. Uh, so if I choose rotate clockwise and click next, I can add a formula. So if I type in 60 and multiply it by DT, so what is DT? It's a built-in variable called delta time, and it ensures that if you multiply it uh, by the number of uh, times uh, per second, uh, it smooths out your game, so regardless of how powerful uh, your computer is or what the frame rate is, uh, delta time is something you don't really have to worry about. It's something you can use uh, to make sure you can use time-related variables without having to worry about how quickly a CPU is running. So if I run that, notice that that looks identical. So the way I found that is actually look for rotate clockwise instead of looking for rotate 60 degrees, because again, that's the parameter. Right. Uh, so the thing that appears finally is a combination of uh, what I added and the parameters I added. So we touched on collisions just a little. These are all identical, so I'll run through these really quickly. Uh, basically, all of these four uh, collisions with, is with the bird and different things on the screen. There is the bottom pipe, the lower pipe, uh, the bird being outside the layout, and the bird uh, overlapping the ground. So obviously, we don't need to check if the bird is uh, overlapping the lower ground, because there's two levels of ground, if you remember on my screen right here. There's the green and the orange. So if we go back to game events, we'll notice we only need to check the collision with the green. Um, and we're doing the same thing for all of them. So notice the template that it ships with shows you how to go to the start layout. It used the quotes in this case, and, and the other ones it used go to layout with the start being selected from the dropdown. Uh, but it does the same thing. So this is one case where you could have actually replaced it with the function. So if you take this template and you want to make some changes to it, this is a great place to uh, reduce this into a single function. Yep, and that's what we did with the lose event function. Yep, for golden ball. The, right? For golden ball, yeah, exactly. Yep. So if in this case, it didn't really make as much sense because you're just you know, there's just one action you're repeating. Yep. But if you're doing a couple of them that you're repeating, a function is a great way to go. Yep. Uh, so next on the screen, we have the scoring uh, group over here. So you'll notice uh, in all of these templates, they actually have very nice comments. So in case you forget what it's doing, uh, again, you can take a look at these comments. Uh, in this case, it's checking to see whether uh, the bird has crossed over the bottom pipe or not. And you'll notice these two things are stuck together. They're both in number 12. So after the first one was added, the second one was added by clicking add and uh, add another condition. So that's sort of like checking an if statement with two things that are also happening together. Uh, these actions are a series of actions, and all three of them happen in sequence if only these two conditions are true. Uh, and those, those events can get a little tricky when you have nested sub-events and if events and else and yep. extra conditions and or conditions. They get a little tricky, but they come with time of just kind of playing around with them and seeing how the logic works. Right. Uh, so again, I'll learn from experience. Um, so let's take a look at these two things here. So we see x is less than bird equals x. So how was that added? I'm just going to say replace condition to see how that works. So as if I'm going to replace it. You'll notice there's something called x is less than bird uh, x. So in this case, um, bottom pipe is the main object. So if I select bottom pipe, and if I start typing in compare, and uh, why do I do that? It's, that's because um, compare uh, uh, is used for comparing variables to see they're greater than, equal to, or less than. And there's less than or equal to symbol clues me in that this is a compare condition. So if I type compare, there's so many different things here. But one thing down here says compare x. So this x over here, it doesn't say bottom pipe dot x because bottom pipe is already the object here. Uh, so when I click compare x and click next, you'll notice that I have the choice of selecting less than or equal. I can start typing in bird dot x. So again, I picked up the word background there because I was typing very quickly. I accidentally picked up the wrong thing from the IntelliSense, but I just retyped bird dot x. Uh, so when, when you enter this, uh, it basically sets it to bottom pipe x less than or equal bird dot x. And when the second one is added, uh, you'll notice it says is scored. Now scored is a Boolean variable that added to bottom pipe itself, uh, or rather the template builder added it. So if you right click on bottom pipe and select instance variable, you'll notice it's got one Boolean variable called scored and it's initially set to false. And that was added simply by clicking on your uh, bottom pipe and then you can click on instance variable from the left panel or you can right click and uh, click instance variables from there. But essentially you click on the plus sign and add a new variable and choose 
type Boolean, and you can set it to a value of false. So once that's added, how do we check for that here? Basically, I'm going to do replace condition again to see how this template was built. And uh, I can choose bottom pipe again. And uh, I'm going to check a Boolean. So when I type in the word Boolean, it says, is, is, instance, uh, is Boolean instance variable set? That's a mouthful, right? Uh, so uh, notice that that has nothing to do with what's being displayed on the screen. But there is the word is followed by the Boolean variable. So if I remember that, I could have typed in is. And there's, again, a lot of options. But if I remember to type is Boolean, there it is. So when you do that, that lets you choose the instance variable. And when you add it by default, this red X doesn't appear. Because it always checks for the positive to see whether it's added or not. So the first time I saw this, I was a little dumbfounded. I was like, how do you add that red X? So I right-clicked on it and noted there's something called invert, which is not red, but it's grayed out. Uh, but if you click that, that actually toggles this red X. So basically, you're saying that if the bird hasn't scored over a pipe, Let's do all these things and add a score. And once that's done, you can set score to true. So basically, what it's doing is that you don't want to keep the scored variable uh, set uh, with the same value after it's set the first time. But you want to reset it every time. Well, so that's those what this pipes will continue to move. Yeah, and you want to score so the, the next pipe. Right, and you only want to score that one pipe once. So it'll continue to be, um, its x coordinate will continue to be less than your bird, but yep. you only want to record that score once. Exactly. Or else you earn a lot of points really fast. <laughs> Uh, so another thing to do here is to look at the background. And again, the background is giving an uh, illusion of movement here. So instead of uh, you know, having the camera move to the right, uh, things are coming to you. So in this case, uh, both the backgrounds over here are being compared. If you recalled earlier, we did a compare uh, where when it just says X or Y, you know, this X belongs to this object here. So again, if you do replace object, it shows you how this object was added. So basically, when an object is selected, uh, we can replace this background. So if I'm going to do undo over here and just say replace condition. So here I can choose the tiled background. And I want to compare that X. So again, I type in compare and compare X. In this case, I can choose less than or equal. And that's how this condition was built. Uh, on this side, you'll notice it says set X. So this one looks a little tricky. Again, it's one of those things where you look at the template, you don't know how it was built. Uh, but if I choose the tiled background, you notice I can type in set. And it has two things here, set boolean and set value. And towards the bottom here, two more things, set x and set y. In this case, it is a set x, because it's for this particular uh, item. So x and y, although are sort of like instance variables that belong to the object, they come with uh, this particular object, uh, just as position, width, height, and x and y. So these are separate from the instance variables that you add manually. So if you had another instance variable, you would add it through set value. If you had an instant variable that's a Boolean, you would add it to set Boolean. So the first time it might get a little confusing, but again, to recap, if you had things like height, position, width, uh, width and x and y, these appear uh, for all objects. And uh, instance variables that you add manually appear under set value, and Boolean's under set Boolean. And one of the cool things, the more familiar you get with the expressions that you're looking for, the set x, or on start of layout, whatever it is, the more you do those things, the more you don't even have to search for them. You just start typing, and you know when it auto-completes and when it's the last thing to search left. You just press Enter, and you go with it, right? So yep. the, more, the more you do this, the faster you get, the more organized you get, and the more you know what to expect when you do different things. Right. So it only, it only gets easier as you work with it more and more. It does. Uh, so next we have the system every tick down here. So what it's essentially doing is it's making sure that uh, Every time uh, every tick happens several times a second, the bottom pipe and the top pipe and both the tiled backgrounds start moving to the left. And the way you do that is you set x to the current value for each of the objects, x value minus a certain scroll speed. And if you just do scroll speed again, that's not good enough. You have to multiply that mystical dt delta time variable and uh, just trust that the system will take care of it for you. Uh, and finally, we have a couple of destroy pipes here. I just make sure that uh, you do some code cleanup uh, when the uh, pipes move off the screen. This is a little different from the initial destroy pipes. The initial destroy pipes takes care of the pipes you had added manually in the layout at the very beginning. This destroy pipes make sure that uh, every uh, certain number of seconds, whenever the pipes move off the screen, uh, those can be disappeared and destroyed. Yeah, just to kind of clarify, we did this earlier with the bullet and the explode objects. Mm -hmm. You have to, any objects you want to use in a layout, you put them in your layout originally, but you may or may not want them to actually show initially, so then you can put them outside the layout and then just destroy them and create yep. more. But they have to be in the layout initially to be able to use them. Yep. So. And uh, you might be wondering, well, how do I get all this stuff working? Uh, well, every X number of seconds, 
uh, you can actually have uh, pipes being created. So how does X seconds get created? So every, let's, let me actually replace this condition. If I choose system, every X seconds, and this actually reflects back to uh, the number of goes we're uh, making appear every X number of seconds. And the, the golden balls. Yeah, the golden, golden balls, balls as well. So in this case, we want to make sure that we use uh, this constant we had created up on the top. Uh, and after X number of seconds, the pipes are being created at certain values. Uh, in this case, you'll notice that the top pipe is actually being created um, on layer zero as well as the bottom pipe. So again, we have this one layer we're working with. And the X values for both of them are set to 440 because they appear in the same X position. So one appears above the other and they appear in the same X position. Uh, but you want to make sure the top pipe always appears in a random spot and the bottom pipe appears in a fixed spot directly below the top pipe. So you don't want both to be random because they could be attaching each other. You don't want that. They so you never make it through. <laughs> exactly. So make sure that the first one's random and the second one appears fixed with below it. That way you can let the bird pass through. Yep. This is exactly what this does. It's saying that uh, for the top pipe, 50 is the X value, negative 250. Uh, actually, the random value appears between 50 and negative 250. Uh, and for the bottom pipe, it says, take the top pipe's Y value, just add a pixel value to it to make sure that uh, it appears below it. Okay. Uh, and finally, we have the score text. Uh, this is actually being set to move to top of layer. The reason this is added is because we didn't have a separate layer for a text. Uh, I know we had some examples where we had a HUD layer. I uh, wanted to appear at the top. Uh, the template builder has added this in uh, to make sure that the score text always appears on the top. Uh, you can get rid of this by simply adding your score text to a different layer that has no parallax. Uh, and finally, uh, after the pipes have been created, uh, we reset the scored Boolean. So we want to make sure that uh, we're, when we're going to set it for every time you pass it, uh, we are resetting it uh, every time new one's created. So that's pretty much it. That's how you uh, ha would have created this, uh, uh, this particular example from and, scratch. And this is a game that was making, like we said earlier, $50,000 a day in advertising. Yep. And you've got a template here that you can start with, but even if you start from scratch, you can make that sort of game and have that potential of making that amount of money in a couple of hours with Construct 2. So that's why we are so excited about yep. it. Yep. Uh, so speaking of being excited, I'm going to go ahead and close this particular template. I'm not going to save that. Uh, let's take a look at uh, another example, which is my Gallon Glider. So again, this actually runs very similar to how we have the game template we just looked at. So when you click Run Layout, you notice that I start playing with this and I'm jumping over all the screens and I'm dead. But there's a high score at the bottom that says six. That's because I played it before and I achieved the top score of six points. Look at that. Uh, and so if I now click we gotta see who can beat your top score and maybe send you a message on Twitter or something. Exactly, so uh, you know, trying to beat the score, this game is available on my site and also on Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8. Uh, if I actually search for games that are installed here, you'll notice that this is actually from the Windows Store. It looks very identical. Again, this version I had played, I clicked on uh, and I had gotten 10 points here. So every time you reinstall a new place, it will have a new high score. So it's not saved in the network. But as you can see, uh, the high score is retained regardless of what you get. Uh, so let's go back to our template here. Um, so if you look at the start uh, event sheet and the other event sheet, they're very similar to what we already looked at. All I did was add, added a couple of things for high score. Uh, I'm not going to go into details of how to create this web storage because James had covered it earlier, uh, but this is something I was able to add here. Uh, for the event sheet, uh, what I did was I replaced the go to start. As you can see, I've right clicked and used toggle disabled instead of deleting it so we can see the example. And I've, I've added a call to end game instead of calling it multiple times. And end game is a function at the very bottom that actually makes sure that uh, the local storage covers your score every time. Uh, another thing you'll notice is uh, the bird is actually no longer a bird, it is now a glider. Uh, so it still says bird. Uh, again, that's something you can have internally when you rename, when you don't rename things, uh, it doesn't appear to the end user. Uh, but what I did over here is if you right click and click edit animations, uh, at any given moment, uh, you can also always have uh, your graphic appear and you can click the open button here and you can reload any other graphics. So here you can see some other games I've been working on. Uh, but basically, if you choose a different graphic to replace it, you can replace what you see on screen. Uh, same goes for the tiled background, right click, edit image, and here I can click open and replace the tiled background to be something else. So that covers how we take an existing template and rebuild it to make our own, change some behaviors, make it unique, uh, and it's ready for publishing. So let's move on to the other uh, templates. So 
The reason we went really deep into the first template is I wanted to show you how to deep dive into all the events. Uh, for the next templates we'll look at, we're going to gloss over them, but won't go too deep in each of the actions and events because we've covered a lot of things. And it's a, it's a great skill to have because although we're going to cover how many, three, four, five templates we're going to cover, there are maybe 10 more that are built into Construct 2, and then the same, same concepts apply if you basically get a project from someone else and they've done a new template or I create another template. Yep. You know how to go through and figure out what the, the person who created it is doing, how to update it, how to change it, and make your own game. So it's a really good um, concept to know how to work with. Exactly. So up next, we have the infinite jump link template I'd mentioned earlier. Uh, I mentioned that it's also a clone of the popular doodle jump where you can uh, move upwards, uh, but the screen actually moves downwards towards you. And uh, I have edited this, uh, and this to show you an in-game progress. So basically, uh, here's a game which I started building using the Ninja Cat uh, character that I already used before. Again, the way the place this character comes from is when I first published an Xbox 360, I'd released a game called Angry Zombie Ninja Cats. It was a full platformer, a cat running around dressed up like a ninja, shooting stars, uh, fighting with swords. And I wanted to build something simpler for touch-based uh, systems. So I made sure that I just used the main character's graphics, and I reused it to build over here. Uh, so notice here it says left and right arrows are tilt mobile device. Uh, if I go back to uh, Construct 2, I'm going to go ahead and open the character for infinite jumping. So let's go ahead and open that. And this is what you're about to get to, I think, is one of the, the cooler features that Construct 2 has, is the ability to take, uh, to know that you're building a game for a mobile device mm -hmm. and be able to use the accelerometer to be able to tilt the device left and right, just like you would in Doodle Jump, to be able to move left and right in the game. Exactly. And we'll see how that's done. In the event sheet, uh, Again, don't pay attention to all the uh, things over here if it looks intimidating. Uh, just know that you can make these your own by, again, changing the graphics and adding additional behaviors, maybe adding a start screen. Right now, you'll notice there's only one layout. Again, uh, when you're releasing a game, always add a start screen, add things that make it unique. Uh, so in this case, I right-click on this particular object, click Edit Animations. When I hit Open, I was able to add my own character. Uh, if you take a look at the event sheet, the one thing I wanted to point out uh, was uh, the touch object. So if you keep scrolling down, you notice something called touch and it says gamma orientation. Uh, so if I right click and do replace condition, and I'm going to choose touch. So if I scroll up and down, you'll notice that it says compare acceleration, compare orientation. And I can actually do this and compare orientation lets me choose alpha, beta, and gamma, and it uh, detects compass direction. Uh, beta is front to back tilt, and uh, gamma is left to right tilt. This is something you can check for if the person moving left and right. That's another way to play the game. Uh, it's a great thing they've already included into this template. Uh, again, um, if you click left and right arrow on your keyboard, it works as well. Let's go ahead and run it, see what that looks like. So again, I'm going to hit left and right arrow on my keyboard because I'm on a computer screen. I can't move this left and right. And you, uh, you have the you have the wrapped behavior too. Yeah. Right? So if I move to the right, it comes out from the other side. I killed you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so again, that's another way to uh, you know, make sure that your game runs on multiple devices. Um, over here, you'll see uh, something that says allow the player to wrap run to left and right. All this is doing is if you move up too much to the left or too much to the right, it resets you on the other side. And they um, do have the wrap behavior. They do it a little differently here because the wrap behavior by default also wraps top to bottom, yep. which they didn't want. They just wanted uh, to go left and right. So that's why they did it custom. Right. Uh, that's a great thing to know because uh, basically you can use the existing behaviors that appear uh, inside the game uh, a tool. And if you want to build your own, in this case, we've added additional things, or rather the template builder has added additional things. So how did I go about and you know, change it to mine? Uh, again, I didn't show you a complete game. I just showed you my version of it. So basically, if I right click on it and go to Ninja Cat Jumper, as it loads up, we'll notice that uh, the Ninja Cat appears in multiple places. That's because I just added the cat character. When I click Run Layout, you'll notice that uh, it's the same character. I did add a flipped uh, 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 event here that flips the character left and right. Um, the example we looked at earlier, we noticed that we could actually change, add multiple animation frames and uh, choose the animation frame uh, for the person to flip to the other side. Uh, another way of doing this is to use a set mirrored object. So here I've said that if you move left or right, uh, basically you can set a player to mirror it or not mirror it. And the way you do that is if you add an action, let's choose a player. And for set mirrored and not mirrored, the action uh, is actually set mirrored. And you might be a little confused because how do you add both not and set mirrored just by choosing the same one? And the way you do that is once you've selected set mirrored, you can uh, change the value to either mirrored or not mirrored. So you're changing it from one place, but just set mirrored first, and then you can choose it to one versus the other. 
So with that, we'll take a look at the uh, remaining uh, templates. So one of them is the infinite runner. Uh, so I didn't want to name a particular 2D runner, although this is a 2D runner, uh, because one particular endless runner that's really popular is Temple Run, which is a 3D runner. So uh, after that, you'll, you'll notice there are a lot of endless runners. Uh, some, some people would say Flappy Bird itself is an endless runner or flyer uh, in that subgenre. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, what I've done is taken their endless runner template and built my own. Uh, so I added a lot of different things to it, and I'm going to show you that in a second. So if I go to my... Okay, so here's the Flapping Bird, uh, or rather the Endless Runner template that we're going to look at. If you click on it, you'll notice that uh, the, pers the character is not really moving, but this is what it ships with. And it gets you a lot of points, and that's all it does. It doesn't have a way to pause the screen or restart or anything like that. So we're going to go ahead and close this window. I'm going to go over to each of the other templates. Let's close this one as well to clear things up. And Ninja Cat Jumper. And finally, we have Ninja Cat Runner. So the way the runner game works is you'll notice I added some buttons over here. Uh, so these, uh, earlier you were asking me where I would get my graphics. Uh, the Ninja Cat is something I built on my own. Uh, the background graphics is something that I downloaded from a free website. The blocks is something I built on my own to replace the original blocks. And the buttons here I got from a free website called iconarchive.com. Again, there are plenty of free websites out there where you can find things or you can purchase icons and graphics for yourself. Also, the title layout is something I put together, uh, again, with free graphics for the background. And have, I have a start button right here that has an event attached to it. So the event for the title event sheet literally just goes to the game layout. I also have some keyboard support here so that if you're playing on your computer, you can play that as well. And finally, if you look at uh, all the events that are here, I didn't have to change most of what came with the template, so I won't go over the things that it normally comes with. But let's uh, touch on the fireball here, because if you run this layout, you'll notice that there's a fireball that's coming after the character. So after a while, you notice a new fireball, and it's always trying to chase the character, and I have a score there. I can pause, I can restart, I can start. So the way all that stuff was added was uh, I added a new fireball object uh, to the game, and the way that's added is actually at a particles object. So notice when I click the fireball, it said that the plugin is particles. So if I right click and insert new object, I added this particles object here. And once you add particles to something, uh, you'll notice in the instance variables and behaviors, it's got things that are unique to it. And I chose a type of continuous spray. And what that does, it makes sure that the fireball is always spraying at you. And it has certain rates and spray cones that it comes at you. Uh, and also, if you look back at the event sheet, you'll notice that the system creates a fireball every five seconds, and it sets a certain position. So it always sets it at the same spot. It doesn't really do anything. It's just there for visual effect. And finally, if we scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll notice I have all these uh, events here for touching uh, the buttons. So basically, I've said, if you're playing the game, pause it when I hit escape or hit the pause button. Uh, when I hit uh, enter or hit the resume button, it continues, and I can restart by clicking the restart button. And again, this is um, something you can add by simply doing add event and add either to each of the buttons that I added to the game. These are all just graphic files. And for each of the graphics, I added a condition, which is when a certain key is pressed, which we had covered earlier. And then system object you should already know about. It goes to specific layouts and resets uh, either the layout or global variables. I can, you want me to run through these really fast? Uh, sure. So now we have uh, a template that James himself has built. Uh, so. Uh, uh, he had actually published a, an app called What's Your Capital. Yep. So we're going to talk about that. Yeah, so um, I mentioned earlier that the generic game template is one that I built that basically handles page navigation, start screen, end screen, game screen, and doing your high score. And I did the trivia template on top of the game template. And what the trivia template does is it allows you to uh, store questions and answers in a text file, read in from those text files, and then uh, display them to the screen, be able to choose correct answers or not if you don't know the answer. Um, keep track of score, all that kind of cool stuff, and it does all that for you, yep. right? So if I don't, do you have the GitHub page open? Uh, I do, yes. So okay. let's go. So ahead. on my GitHub page, it's GitHub.com/jqquick223. Uh, there it is. Okay. So and then if you go into Construct to Templates. Yep, I'm there. Okay, and under the Construct to Templates, you'll see the game template and the trivia template. And there's an About Me file at the bottom to read about and kind of learn how to use them and leverage them. But I think they're a great place to start. I've built the, um, the golden ball that I actually published was built on top of the game template. And then the What's Your Capital 
game I built with the trivia template. So it's just a know your capitals kind of game. Yep. Um, but I did it to, to give people a head start, just like the Flappy Bird template. Um, so I try to keep the, the game one as general as possible and then make the trivia one specific for uh, trivia games. Yep, and that brings us to the end of the uh, slides, uh, which we can see the generic game template here. And this actually, uh, as James pointed out, uh, gives you some uh, basic layouts that you can start your game with. And uh, you can take out the existing backgrounds and other things that are there, but it's a great place to get started for your next game. Cool, so that, uh, that wraps up module three. I think so. And uh, I think we're gonna take another 10 minute break and yep. come back and wrap up with module four. We'll see you then. Yep, see you soon. And welcome back to Developing Games with Construct 2. This is the fourth and final module of today. And I'm Shahed again, and this is... James. So we're going to talk about how you can export and publish your game. Uh, so starting off, we have the main slide here talks about exporting and publishing your game. So we're going to go specifically into exporting to the web, and then we'll talk about publishing to Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8, and we'll show you a couple of examples that we've published ourselves. If you've seen the earlier modules, you've already taken a look at some of the games that we've been working on building upon templates or building from scratch, uh, you'll see what these games look like in the marketplace. All right, so first, a module overview. Uh, so for exporting your game, we're going to look at how you can update your project settings, because some of the default project settings don't really carry over properly to the store. This includes the name of your project, uh, the description that you have for your game, and also some other things like graphics and store logos that we're going to see in a few minutes. Uh, next up, we have exporting uh, to the web process, and this will let, make sure that your game becomes an HTML5 and JavaScript game that runs on any modern smartphone browser or any computer browser. So basically, any browser that supports HTML5. And this is what we talked about um, at the beginning, where through the HTML5, basically a web app or a web game, you can indirectly uh, go to any platform, so Android and iOS, through uh, PhoneGap or something like that. Yep. Uh, but we do have the direct support to come straight to Windows 8 and Windows Phone. Exactly. Uh, and finally, uh, we talked earlier about uh, exporting to Windows in a universal format. So you might be wondering, what is a universal format we've mentioned before? Well, what it is is it lets you publish to both Windows Phone and Windows 8 with manual effort, uh, basically making sure that you can reuse the maximum of what you've uh, already done for your game or your app. In this case, we're publishing a game, and we're publishing it twice, but the effort to create that game is really uh, one major effort. The second part of the module overview shows us about uh, the additional things you need to do to get your game out of the marketplace. So earlier we saw how we can click the Run Layout button, the giant triangle play button that appears in your uh, uh, UI for Construct 2. But if you want to publish the game, uh, there's some things you have to do. You need a certificate, you have to associate your game with something up in the App Store or Microsoft's Windows Store, and uh, you have to open a developer account to make sure that you're able to publish that game. And uh, you know, James and I have both published our own games. We've had to go through the steps. It's really easy, and we're going to go through some of the steps and some of the pitfalls that you need to avoid to be able to do that on your own. Yeah, and the more you do it, it's just like anything else. And what we've talked about with Construct 2, the more you do it, the more you learn, the easier it is, and you kind of avoid those pitfalls that we'll try to call out for you guys just to make it as easy as possible your first time. Yep, and then we'll wrap up with creating the store graphics we mentioned uh, and also creating a package that we need to upload into the store. Uh, finally, we're going to publish to both Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8. We're going to cover most of what it takes to publish on Windows 8. Uh, publishing Windows 8, uh, Phone 8, and Windows 8 is very similar. Uh, so we'll gloss over the second part of it. Uh, but again, uh, during the chat session, make sure you ask any additional questions. And you'll also find our Twitter handles on our intro page. Uh, make sure you take a look at that. Reach out uh, to us with any questions you may have. Uh, we'll try and go over as much as possible during this last module. All right, so now we have exporting your game. So in this slide, you can take a look at what the project settings normally look like. If you've uh, seen the earlier modules, you'll notice that every time you click on something uh, out on the left, uh, on the right, I'm going to do a circle around here, uh, you can see that uh, your project panel shows you things that appear uh, for which you can see property panels on the left. Now the way that works is that so when you click on something, the properties appear. We've already covered that. This is context sensitive. But what if you want to change something at the project level? And the way you do that is you click on the project itself. Initially, it's called Untitled Project, so you can rename it to whatever your game is. In this case, I've renamed it to My Awesome Game. Uh, so I'm going to take that game and publish it. 
So I need a description for it. So on the left, you see I've added a description called this is my game, and I've added a fake author name and a fake email address just for the sample, but again, you'd like to add your own information there. And finally, uh, there's a full screen and browser option, which is normally set to letterbox scale by default. Uh, there's some tutorials that ask you to not set it to full screen and browser if you're not expecting a full screen mode. Uh, but when, whenever you publish to the web, uh, you wanna make sure that uh, you do have full screen and browser. What it does, it adds two black bars above and below your game. Uh, depending on what mode you're in, you can also uh, restrict the orientation in Visual Studio as you're publishing it. But again, uh, I think the best option by default is to set it to letterbox scale. So next we have the actual export button. So if you've seen us go through the UI for Construct 2, you've already seen us click on the giant uh, Run Layout button that appears on the top. Well, next to it, or very close to it, is another button that says Export Project. Uh, clicking on that gives you uh, a range of options here. Now, these options usually change over time as uh, Sarah adds additional features and platforms that they support. Uh, but there's something out there called HTML5 website, and that's been there for a really long time. And that's it lets you publish your game to a website. Now, it doesn't immediately publish it to a site that's available publicly. Uh, but once you get it out there um, onto your hard drive, you can take that and upload it to another site. And you could do through Azure or something like that, you could do an Azure website and just kind of point to that, that uh, website folder, that project yep. folder for the website. Now let's take a look at what that looks like. So if I go over to Construct 2, here I have my own version of Gallant Glider, which we looked at earlier. Uh, I can run this game, pops up in a browser, and I'm playing it, all looks great. Now I'm ready to publish it. So if I go back to Construct 2, uh, I click on the Export Project button. You notice that I can scroll all the way to the top and I can click on HTML5 website. And when I click on that, I click Next. And you notice it already has something filled in. Um, I always recommend changing this because by default it sets it to my users folder, um, it sets it to the desktop folder within that, and creates a folder on its own. Uh, it doesn't usually ask me whether I want to replace it or not. So what I can usually do is when I uh, select this, I always need to select uh, an option or rather a path uh, that I want to publish to. So in this case, let me go to my glider folder where I've been publishing my game several times. Uh, you'll notice a bunch of check marks on my screen, some exclamation marks. I've been running this through source control just to make sure I have a copy of it. Uh, so again, I would highly recommend using source control if you have it available. Uh, there are many different available options in the market. Uh, just use whatever uh, fits, uh, fits your needs the best. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and copy this path. You can also click the dot, dot, dot and select your own path. Uh, I would suggest leaving the default uh, options for subfolders for images and media and uh, leaving the PNG compression as standard. So you could do the brute uh, version of the PNG compression. It is very slow, so don't worry about that. Uh, and finally, there's an option to minify your script. So let's take a second to talk about that. Uh, when you minify a JavaScript file, what it does is it compresses the contents of that file, makes it virtually unreadable to a human being, uh, although the computer will still be able to run all your code. Uh, your variables might be shortened, uh, thing, all the white space might be removed, things might be a little uh, more uh, compressed and also easier for the computer to run. But it also makes it more difficult for a person to then open your JavaScript file. So it's a good option to have that checked. But one thing it does say is you must have Java installed to run the minifier. Now Java uh, usually uh, comes with uh, either a JVM or some other uh, Java virtual machine that runs on your local machine. Uh, if you have a 64-bit Windows machine, uh, chances are you may have the 32-bit version of Java installed. So there's one error message that Construct 2 users frequently get is when they click the Next button, and if they, if they click the Export button after choosing Normal Style or any of the available styles, you notice it starts exporting the project, and it asks you, uh, or, it, or it lets you know that there's some sort of error, but the script, although the script has not been minified, the exported project should still work. What that means is that because I have a 64-bit Windows and the 64-bit version of Construct 2, it wasn't able to use a 32-bit version of Java that I had installed because I already had that version of Java installed to work with my 32-bit browsers. Um, in this case, I didn't bother to install the 64-bit version of Java because uh, I'm not really concerned with the minification. If this is something that concerns you, I would highly recommend then manually downloading the 64-bit version of Java, which should take care of this issue. Again, not a major issue. It is your personal preference. So when I click OK, the final thing I notice is it says Open Destination Folder. In this case, I can click on Open Destination Folder, and it shows uh, all the uh, files that has been recreated. You'll notice that uh, most of the files are green and a couple of them are red. This just means the last time I exported these files, I checked them into source control. And uh, recently, when I just uh, 
exported them, it replaced a couple of these files. So, yeah, so you'll notice that it doesn't really change everything at all times. It, if I had updated some images, you would see some changes there too. Yep, and again, this is the this is the source project that you can take and basically build a web app, right? You just yep. if you have a domain name or something, you can point to this project, and that will be your web app game in the browser. And then again, indirectly, um, you can go through PhoneGap or something like that, which will actually convert that web app, that website, into an iPhone app or an Android app or something like that. Yep. So earlier we had mentioned something about performance. So when you publish to Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8, which we'll see in a minute, uh, the performance is pretty good uh, because you can publish it as a JavaScript app. But if you choose something like PhoneGap to publish to some of the third-party platforms, uh, you'll notice there's some performance delays, uh, mainly because PhoneGap is another app around your web app. Uh, so when you're using Construct 2, I would recommend publishing it to the web and also to the Windows platforms. Uh, so here you can see our uh, index.html file, which is the main file that's actually being displayed, uh, that actually, that's actually used to display your game. And there's an images subfolder, which contains all the images for the game. And uh, that, gets, uh, push, that can get pushed out to any web server. And as James mentioned, you get an Azure website from Microsoft uh, to host your own website. Um, you can take any of these files and copy it as is, and it should just work. Uh, so what does that look like on a website? So earlier when we'd run my game locally, we'd seen that we're able to play it here. We'd also taken a look at what the game looks like um, whenever we run it directly from the app that's installed on my machine. Well, on my website itself, on my blog, which is wakeupandcode.com, uh, I was able to and copy over the Glider app or Glider game. And you'll notice that it runs exactly the same way. You'll notice the high score is set to zero because I'm running this for the first time after uploading it. And I can go ahead and play the game. And I got one point. I got two points. And if I let it die, it remembers the high score. So again, you'll see that the game runs identically on all these platforms. And it's great to have one single level of effort uh, to be able to publish multiple places. Yeah, that's what's so fabulous about Construct 2 is that you build this game once, and you can tweak some settings or something for the different platforms. But then you can take that project and go basically anywhere. So it's, um, I mean, it's fantastic because you want to you want to hit as many platforms as possible. You want to have as many users as possible. That means more downloads, more ratings, more in-app purchases, whatever it is. And uh, it's a great way to get started and take advantage of the cross-platform capabilities. Yep. Uh, so with that, we've discussed how you can export and publish to an HTML5 website. And at the same time, you can share it with the world. Uh, you can share it with people who may or may not have the same device that you have. But if they have a web browser, they can try out your game. Next, we have exporting to Windows. So on the next slide, we have uh, a couple of screens here. And I've showed you this overlaid screen because this is uh, what you see when you click one button and then the next button after that. So essentially, clicking on export project, as you notice, gives you multiple places to publish your game to. One of them is Windows Store. If you've used earlier versions of Construct 2, you may have noticed that Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8 appears two different options. And now that there's a universal option, uh, Windows Store gives you one single place to publish to both the old platforms and also to the new 8.1 version of Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8. You'll notice here it also says Visual Studio 2013.2. That's because with Visual Studio 2013 Update 2, we had the opportunity to publish to universal apps. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Yeah, so again, you will need uh, not the latest version, because there's there's an update three of Visual yep, Studio. So Visual Studio 2013 has come up with update three recently. Yeah, so you just you need at least uh, Visual Studio 2013 update two to yep. be able to take advantage of the universal app projects. And uh, in case you're wondering how you can get the latest version, the Express version of Visual Studio uh, does offer a lot of this functionality, including the universal format. And if you want a more complete version, for students, Microsoft provides uh, free software through the DreamSpark program. You go to dreamspark.com. And if you want uh, more software as a professional, if you're starting your own startup, you can go to bizspark.com. That's B-I-Z, uh, spark.com. And you can sign up as a new startup and get Visual Studio for free. Uh, so in addition, it'll give you a, a token for the store for your developer account. Yep. So usually it costs $20 to publish or to get your developer account for Windows 8, Windows Phone through BizSpark and DreamSpark. You get a token to basically waive that fee so you can get started for free, have all your tools and your developer account for free. Yep. Uh, so yeah, in case you're worried about a uh, couple of dollars spending here and there, uh, you can definitely take advantage of the free soft, uh, software that Microsoft has to offer. Uh, so let's move on to actually publishing for Windows. So if you can uh, look at my screen here, you'll notice that I'm going to click on the Export Project button again. And this time, instead of clicking on HTML5 website, I'm going to scroll down past all the other platforms that are available, and I'll click on Windows Store. So again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they have consolidated Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8 to Windows Store. When I click on that, 
uh, it lets me choose the path. Remember when I told you earlier, you gotta watch out for that path because it remembers the last path that I put in and it defaults to a single value that uh, it uh, defaults to by default. Uh, meaning that uh, when I had the desktop version of uh, my folder, uh, it would overwrite that desktop folder every time I run it. So in this case, I publish to the web folder and uh, it appears to want to republish to that same folder. So I don't wanna do that right now. I'd like to publish to a Windows 8 subfolder. Um, in this case, we don't have to create it by scr uh, from scratch. We can just type it up here and it will create it for me. So let me go ahead and click export. And now it gives me a couple of options here. So if you remember from my slide, I had shown you a couple of different options for Windows Phone and Windows 8. So in this case, we're going to choose Universal and click on Export. And we are, I mean, since May, since, or since build the announcements of Universal Apps, we're really making a push for Universal Apps. It's a great way, we talked about it, to, uh, to have minimal effort to target two different platforms. So it's really what we're pushing for. It's really what we're encouraging. So we encourage you guys to do the same thing versus uh, doing a phone project and a Windows 8 project. Do a universal, it's got it all there in one project, which you'll see in a second, and you can kind of go from there. Yep, uh, so the next step here is that after my project successfully exported, uh, I've chosen to minify the files, but again, uh, because I don't have the, uh, the correct version of uh, the Java, uh, min uh, Java engine, uh, we have uh, intentionally avoided that, and we've now got into the stage where the uh, app has been exported. So let's go ahead and open the destination folder. Again, you'll notice a bunch of red exclamation marks because I had exported here before. Again, uh, based on the uh, source control uh, system that you use, you're gonna see that files change. And this is a great way to see what changes between uh, one um, export versus another. Let's go ahead and uh, open up Visual Studio here. So when I go to Visual Studio, you'll notice I'm actually logged in at the top. So I've used the account that I'm gonna publish with. So make sure you're logged in correctly. And when you're publishing and associating with the store, you're gonna be prompted to go ahead and uh, sign up, uh, sign in again, and you're gonna have to associate your game or app with the item in the store or create something new. So let's go ahead and create that, open that solution that I had uh, just published to, which is the Win8 subfolder. Let's go ahead and open that. And while that's loading, one thing that, that we talked about we had an issue with is you have to verify your account when you go to publish uh, through Visual Studio, so that'll send you one of those text messages or an email with a token that you can uh, verify your account with. And I, hopefully we've taken care of that and we'll be good with it, but just for you guys out there, you might have to do that a time or two just to make sure that, that you're cleared to go through your account to your developer account through Visual Studio and be able to publish. Yep, and let's take a look at uh, my screen again and see uh, what it looks like. So here's what the solution looks like. I have three folders. One is a shared project, and uh, or three uh, projects rather. One is a shared project, and one is uh, for Windows Phone, another one's for Windows 8. Uh, so the Windows 8.1 project here has a manifest file, and I have it open right now. So let's go double click again to show you that's the correct file I've opened. You notice a red X here, so if I try to build my solution, I'll notice a couple of errors here. So one is for the Windows Phone project, and one is for the Windows 8 project. Uh, so if you associate this with the store, that will automatically associate your app and uh, give you a correct certificate. But if you still want to run it locally, a good way to get around that is to click on Packaging and see where it says choose certificate. I can click on the choose certificate button and then choose create test certificate and leave the default common name there. And it asks me whether I want to replace it because this had, uh, I'd already done this step before and I'm going to click yes. So once it does that, you'll notice a red X goes away and I'll try to rebuild the solution. And you'll notice that uh, the second one is missing from uh, the Windows Phone project. So I'm going to show you how to change that as well. So. If I go to the second one, you'll notice that I can, I can click on the Packaging tab, and there's no place for me to add a test certificate. Uh, so one way to get around this, I'm gonna go ahead and open the code version of this. So I right click on the manifest file, I can click on View Code, and I'm gonna go ahead and say yes to this because it says this manifest file is already open in the Visual Designer. If I say yes, it'll open up in code mode. And you'll notice that I have uh, a little squiggly line other, under identity. So if I go into the Windows 8 version, I'm going to open that and look at it for comparison, see what that looks like. And once that's open, you'll notice there's a publisher tag with the value there. So don't worry about exactly what it says. We're just doing this as a workaround so we can run our game uh, manually on my local machine. Once it's asso associated with the App Store, you don't have to worry about this step. So back at my screen, we're going to go ahead and copy this line, go to the package manifest for the Windows Phone 8 project that I had opened earlier. I'm gonna go ahead and paste it. I'm gonna click Build Solution again. 
And you notice at the lower left corner over here, it says that uh, it has built successfully. So once that's done, um, I can go ahead and run it locally. So you'll notice there's a bold sign around, uh, or bold text around this project. That means this is a default startup project. If I click on this play button, the green play button on the top, that's going to run the game locally. So notice it starts off with a gray X because I don't have a splash screen by default, but I can click the play button, and I'm running this all within Visual Studio. Uh, this so is again, running on your local machine. It's running on it's my not local running, machine. It's not running directly through a browser. Yep. It's not running nothing with Construct 2. It's running on your actual local machine. Yep, so it is now a Visual Studio project. Yep. And this is, this is exactly how the Windows 8 app would work on a physical device is what you just saw right there. Yep. Right. Uh, so I can either uh, close the Windows Store app or I can uh, hit Alt F4 to close it. But now I'm going to go ahead and associate it with something in the store. Uh, so before you do that, I actually want to show you what the Windows Phone 8 app looks like. So I can click Store, and then uh, you want to run that. I one actually first. want to set a startup project. That's what I was looking for. And notice how the play button changes. It says uh, run the emulator. It's got some other options here. Or if I had a device attached, I could uh, run it directly Windows 8, uh, Windows Phone 8 device. So I'll run it in the emulator. And we do have, there will, there either will be or has already been a jump start on universal apps. So I would encourage, especially if you're going to be dealing with universal apps coming from Construct 2, I would encourage you guys to check that out as well. And you can uh, kind of get filled in on some of the details that we might not cover from the universal app perspective because we're really just focusing on the publishing portion. But there's, there's a lot of detail that goes into that whole realm of universal apps. And it's very interesting and a good thing to get familiar with. Yep. Uh, so again, back at my screen, we'll notice that the Windows Phone 8 emulator is up, and it has actually loaded my Gallon Glider app, and it can high score zero. It's a new environment. Uh, the session value has not been set yet. I can cl click play, and I can start playing the game in Windows Phone 8 within the simulator. So again, I just got one point a while ago. It says high score one. Uh, you can actually rotate this around to see if your game works correctly, which it does. Again, you could restrict it to uh, specific orientations, or you can leave it as is. Uh, but one thing you'll notice that when each of the games were coming up, um, especially when you noticed it with the Windows 8 game, there's a big uh, gray X there. So if we go into the package manifest file, we're going to close the code version of it. And we'll notice that uh, we have visual assets. And if you scroll down, there's a gray X over there. So what happened is uh, every time uh, Construct 2 exports your game, it does replace these files. So what you can do is you can replace them with your own version. So we'll see uh, in a few minutes uh, how we can take care of this. Uh, but this is absolutely necessary before you can publish to the App Store. Yeah, so Construct 2 just basically gives you some filler graphics just to, to hold a place, basically. And you have to go in and fill in those graphics with your real logos and splash screens and stuff like that. If you don't do that and try to submit, they will actually reject you from the store because of not having original icons and logos and stuff like that. So you'd have to make sure you do it. Yep, and uh, before you publish to the store, you'll notice that there are uh, things you can do to certify your game. Uh, we're going to go through the steps again to make sure that you run the local, uh, local cert kit, and that'll make sure that there's nothing wrong with your game. You can, it's ready to publish to the store. All right, uh, so up next, uh, this part of the module uh, is called publishing your game. So to learn about publishing your game, let's look at how you can create a certificate. Now, this is one of the steps I had covered earlier. Um, this is uh, kind of important when you run it locally. But once this is done, since we've uh, pretty much covered this, I'm going to move on to the next slide, is uh, how to open your developer account. Now, if you've been to uh, Microsoft Developer website, uh, as you're clicking around, you'll notice that the URL changes as you're clicking from one part to another. Uh, the best way to get started is start at the root URL, which is dev.windows.com. Uh, there used to be separate uh, entry points for Windows Phone 8 versus Windows 8, and now that's really simplified. There's one version, uh, which is just dev.windows.com, whether you're publishing for Windows 8 or Windows Phone 8. Let's go to the website, see what it looks like. Yeah, so since, well, since I've started uh, within over the last year, the two different store accounts, the Windows 8 and Windows Phone, have just gotten closer and closer together. Yep. So from universal apps to the actual store websites being combined into the dev.windows.com, everything's just kind of getting closer and closer and tied together. So, right. yeah, right, dev.windows.com is the website I always remember. That's where I go to, and then from there, you can choose. Uh, you'll see it in a second, um, but you can choose to go to Windows Phone or Windows 8. Yep. Uh, so here we are on dev.windows.com. Uh, the URL also has uh, en-us at the end. Again, that gets attached automatically uh, depending on your region. Uh, in this case, uh, en English. Uh, e en stands for English, and us is obviously United States. Uh, so as long as you go to dev.windows.com, you'll end up at the Windows Dev Center. So here I've signed in to my dev account. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in a little here so you can see this a little better. And I'm going to click on the dashboard link on the top left here. So if I circle this part here, there's a dashboard link in the top left. So once you click that, you can get access to either the Windows Store or the Windows Phone Store dashboard. So if I click on Windows Store, you'll notice that there is something they've already published there. Again, there's an incomplete game that uh, I added as a test called My Second Game. And below is Gallant Glider, and I've added these recently. Um, so again, um, depending on where you are in your, in your uh, progress, you can check to see whether the uh, game has a certain number of downloads, or you can check to see uh, whether it's passed certification or not. Uh, you'll also notice in the lower left, there's something called Windows Phone Dashboard. So if I click on that, that lets me go to the Windows Phone version of the dashboard. Again, there's one entry point. You can go to both places uh, by clicking on the links. So again, same thing here. I can click on the word Apps in the left, and I can check to see that Gallon Glider is available here as well, and I can see the last update date and so on. So if I go back to my uh, PowerPoint slide, uh, I recommend that you start off at the website. Uh, go ahead and sign up for a developer account. Uh, if you have any questions, again, you can ask us on Twitter. Uh, you'd see the, uh, our Twitter handles on our profile pages. And uh, also, uh, feel free to follow up with us. So once you sign up, you'll have the opportunity to create your uh, game name on the website. Uh, but you can also create it from Visual Studio. And I would highly recommend creating it from Visual Studio because it allows you to log in. It's very tightly integrated. So in this screenshot here, we see that you can right click on any of your projects and you can uh, select the store option. Now there's other ways to get to this by going from the top menu, but this is so much easier because uh, it lets you find which project you're currently working, working on. And you can choose either associate with App Store or the next two options, capture screenshots and create app packages. We'll get to those in a minute. So let's start with create store. So if I right click on uh, my Windows 8 project, I'm just gonna set it as startup project. And if I choose store, I can say associate app with the store. Now, I already have a game associated with this app, but this screen is very uh, open-ended. Uh, the first thing it does is ask me to sign in because I'm already signed in. As James mentioned, sometimes you might be prompted to sign in again. Uh, if it does prompt you, go ahead and sign in at this point. But if you do get a verification code notification, what that does, it allows you to do two-step authentication where you might be asked to provide an additional email address or maybe a phone number uh, so you can get a verification code. Uh, a lot of secure websites do this to make sure that no one else is uh, logging into your account. Uh, so I've already uh, uh, I logged in as myself, so I'm gonna go ahead and click Next. And here it shows me the same two apps that I created on the website. Do you remember Gallant Glider, which already exists, and my second game, which hasn't uh, received any packages yet. So I'm just gonna go ahead and select Gallant Glider, or if you notice at the bottom, I could associate it with a new app. So let's say this is a brand new app you're publishing for the first time, or if you don't have any apps listed here, uh, you can just uh, select a new name. And that will, <clears throat> that will go into the store and actually reserve the name for your app. So yep. regardless of whether or not you're actually uh, ready to publish, you can go ahead and reserve that name so no one can take it in the future. That way you're guaranteed by the time you're ready to have that name for your app that you want. Exactly. Um, and also another thing you'll notice on my screen is there's a checkbox towards the top. And uh, this one says include app names that, have, that already have packages. And this is useful because uh, in case you'd like to update your existing game or app, uh, you can always check that checkbox and make sure you find the existing one instead of worrying about where your game disappeared. Uh, also, you'll notice that I'd like to use the words game and app interchangeably. Uh, in this case, uh, while well, we're using Construct 2, we're building games, but everything in the Windows Store uh, is essentially an app. Uh, the word app gets used for both all the apps in the store and also for apps that are not games. So you'll see me <laughs> using those both interchangeably. Uh, so moving on to the next screen, we've selected Gallant Glider. We're going to click Next. Uh, you'll notice that it says Associate, so I can click on Associate to uh, make sure that this is attached to my game that's on the store. And that's basically the certificate that we created, a test certificate early, yep. earlier. This is basically the real publishable certificate that will auto-populate this stuff in those manifest files. Right, so here in the next screen it says, uh, do you want to overwrite this PFX file? And since it did get created the first time, I'm going to say yes and it's gonna go ahead and uh, update it. So basically it gets associated correctly. Uh, so if I go back to my PowerPoint here, you'll notice the next option here is capture screenshots. Uh, so in order to do that, you might be wondering, well, where do the screenshots go? Well, sometimes you're like me, you don't remember where things get uh, added automatically. Well, uh, on your pictures folder within your documents, uh, you'll notice there's a subfolder called Windows Simulator. In this case, I've taken some screenshots, as you can see from my Ninja Cat Runner game, um, and you're able to capture them so you can add them. 
Uh, so the two things you might wonder is, well, how do I capture them and how do I upload them? So we're going to see how you do that. So we're going to right click on the Windows project. We'll click Store. Click on Capture Screenshots. And it gives you some information here in case you forget. It says, uh, this will build the project and launch the app in the simulator. So you must have a project that's free of error so it, it can actually build and run. And it's, uh, to capture the screenshots, there's going to be a copy screenshot button on the simulator sidebar. So let's see what that looks like. And while the simulator is loading, you could either, you could either take your screenshots in the, in the simulator or from running the, the app on your local machine, you could just do a, a Windows key and then print screen yep. and just take a print screen of your actual screen and use that as well. Right, so there's many different ways to do this. Uh, Windows, it makes it really easy uh, to do this for any app or game. In case you're running a full screen app or game, this lets you run your game or app within the simulator. So again, back in my screen, we'll notice there's a full screen simulator that's just being displayed in portrait mode. Again, I can uh, rotate it just like the Windows Phone 8 simulator. Uh, and this one lets me turn it all the way around. And I'm gonna go ahead and take a screenshot. So notice there's a little button here that looks like a camera. That's a copy screenshot button. So when I click on that, that takes a screenshot and it automatically updates my pictures folder. Uh, so if I click the play button, I can keep playing it. The tricky part is, how do I play the game and click on that screenshot? So I have a touchscreen monitor uh, during my presentation right here that I can actually click on uh, the jump and then maybe quickly click on the camera button here. Again, it uh, really depends on how you want to do it. It's a game in itself. <laughs> That's a game in itself. I'm going to use two fingers here, click on play, and I'm going to also click on uh, the little camera icon there. So again, that lets me uh, click and create multiple screenshots. So in case you're wondering, again, where those screenshots go, I'm going to go ahead and right click and close this. And then uh, if I go to my um, Windows folders, and I'm going to go ahead and find my pictures folder, and there's my Windows simulator folder, and you'll see a whole bunch of screenshots there. So every time I'm taking a screenshot, it's appeared there. You can use any of these. You can crop them and change them around. Uh, and finally, we come down to these gray boxes here. So what do you do about these? What I did in my case was when I exported my Windows 8, if you recall, I had to use source control to replace them. Now, where does it get replaced? Well, in your Windows 8 subfolder, uh, you'll notice Gallant Glider has three folders, one for shared, one for Windows, one for Windows Phone. So under the Windows uh, folder, there's an images folder that contains a bunch of images. So I'm gonna highlight a couple of these here. Uh, so these are the ones that are my screenshots and the promotional images. Uh, but everything else here that has a red exclamation marks are the ones that got replaced, uh, again, with the Xs. So you'll see these are uh, transparent background images that have been replaced. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and revert. In your case, uh, if you're doing updates for your game, uh, you're going to either have to replace it uh, manually or uh, use source control to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and choose, in this case, SVN revert, and once that happens, you'll notice that uh, it got reverted to these cool looking graphics here. Uh, and the way I did that is I created those manually elsewhere, I brought these over. Uh, when you're doing this for the first time, uh, you won't have something to revert to. I would recommend creating them in a graphics program and bringing them in here. So once that's done, you'll notice that it appears automatically within Visual Studio. So Visual Studio does pick up uh, where the graphics are. Right, and you could have you could have also replaced those images in Visual Studio as well. So instead of going into the actual folder, you could do that in Visual Studio. Just hit that dot 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 button, yep. pull up the image, and replace it with uh, with your own image. Yep. So again, back in my screen, you'll notice there's a dot 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 that James has mentioned. Uh, all of the images have this. If you click on that, you'll make sure that you can replace it with your own version. Uh, so with that done, I want to highlight uh, something else that says capabilities here. And notice that by default, uh, it has internet client ena enabled. And this is something that Construct 2 had enabled for me when it exported the uh, Visual Studio version. I actually don't want uh, any internet uh, client capability. Uh, if you try to publish something with this enabled, uh, the Microsoft website will ask you to provide a privacy policy and then some other things uh, that you may not need. So again, you can uncheck that and you can save your project build it again, make sure everything runs. Yeah, like you said, you will be forced to include a privacy policy if you have that checkbox on the internet. If you don't have that, you don't have to have a privacy policy. I think it's still encouraged, but it's not a requirement because uh, you don't have the, the, nece the necessity of using the internet. Exactly. Uh, so again, I'm now opening up uh, the Windows Phone 8 version. Uh, you'll notice that uh, I've opened up the Windows Phone 8 uh, project on the right and I've opened up the Apex manifest file. And I've noticed that it actually unchecked my internet here as well. I'm gonna go ahead and uncheck that. So again, this is one of those things where Construct 2 does a lot for you. There's some things you may or may not need. It's totally up to you. In my case, I've chosen not to include this, so I've unchecked these. So now these are ready to 
be included, I do have another step remaining. So if I go to the next slide in my screenshots, uh, there's something called create app packages. So let's go ahead and run that and see what that looks like. Have you done your images for your Windows Phone project also? Uh, I have, yes. Okay. So let's go ahead and click store and say create app packages. So this part will ask me, hey, do you want to build packages for, to upload to the Windows Store? And I'll say, sure. Uh, I'll click Next. And once again, it'll either prompt me to log in, or it would have already logged in for me, or because I've uh, logged in recently and hasn't cleared my credentials yet. Um, if you decide to switch uh, logins and log in with a different account, there is a link here that says uh, clear cache credentials and sign in. You can choose to do that as well. I'll use my existing login and sign in. Uh, you notice that uh, my Windows uh, 8 app shows these two different apps. Uh, that I had created before. I'm going to select Gallon Glider, click Next. And now, this looks a little different from associating my app package. I've already associated with, uh, it with my uh, game, but now it's going to create a local version of this. I'll just copy it so I can take a look at it later. And I can choose to automatically increment this. And I'll click Create. And you'll notice that uh, it has a little error message at the bottom. It says, hey, uh, there's a version number error over here. It needs to be higher than a certain amount because the version I published uh, before onto the App Store already has a version of 1103, and now I just created a new version uh, from Construct 2, and I didn't uh, update the version number from within. So let's go ahead and try that again, and this time we're gonna go ahead and update it. Or we can go to our, uh, one of our application settings. Go to packaging, we'll notice that uh, it has 1000 here. So I'm just gonna change that to 1104. Again, these are arbitrary numbers. You can change whatever you want. So I'll go ahead and change that and click Build. Right-click my Windows project, go to Store, Create App Packages. I will click Next. And once I select Gallon Glider and I'm ready to create my update package, uh, you'll notice that it still has this 1101 there. Uh, but over here, I would like to change 1104. So it's a little confused. So I'm going to change to 1104. Again, these are arbitrary numbers. There's no hard and fast rule. Uh, you just have to be consistent with yourself. So I will say Create That. So now it's built something correctly. It notes that the version that I uploaded last time was 1103, and the local file has to be a little uh, higher than the previous one. So now let's go ahead and click that link, and you'll notice that it's got some other versions that I created up here, and this is the latest version that I want to include. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on that a little. Uh, so over here it says Gallon Glider, and it has the version number of 1104, and it has the file extension of AppX Upload. That's the version we're looking for. So notice the last button here, it says Launch Windows App Certification Kit. Uh, I won't click on this right now. It takes uh, sometimes several seconds or several minutes. What it does is essentially launch your game uh, in full screen mode within your machine, and it does a bunch of tests to make sure there's nothing wrong with your game. Uh, it may look like it's hanging, but uh, do let the game run in this mode because it's gonna go ahead and run it for you, and it'll do some tests and it'll eventually shut down on its own. Um, it'll come back with some results, you were saying, James? Yeah, and the, and the reason it doesn't work very well in demos is because it will actually open your app, and it'll, it'll open your app, close it, open it, close it, and you're not supposed to touch anything while it's doing that or you'll kind of mess up the test. So it, it can take uh, maybe three to five minutes or so. So for demo purposes, it's not uh, very practical here, uh, but it's very straightforward. It'll just run on its own. You leave it, let it run for five minutes, however long it takes. And then it'll come back and it'll tell you whether or not it had any problems, and I highly we highly encourage people to do this because it gives you a quicker way to kind of gauge whether or not you have any errors before going and submitting to the store. Yep. So if you if you pass on the certification test, you're not guaranteed to pass in the store, but you're you're well on your way, I guess you could say. Yep. So you'll notice that uh, your app packages have already been created if you look on the screen, and uh, there's a close button there. So it's not absolutely mandatory to cr uh, click this button, uh, but again, it's highly recommended. So I'm going to go ahead and close this for now. And uh, we're going to go ahead and check to see what it looks like to upload a game. Now, if I click on the dashboard, you'll notice that I'm still on the Windows Phone dashboard. So how do we get back to the Windows dashboard? On the lower left, you'll see a link to get us back. So as this is loading, um, just a quick reminder that uh, there's a couple of other things that we'd like to update. So in this case, let me actually go into uh, Apps in the Store, and I'm going to go ahead and click on Details. And again, this is an app that they can go out and download themselves and try out, correct? Yep. Uh, so you can see I have a very small number of downloads here. It's a recent game. So if you feel like there's something you'd like to play, you can go ahead and try it out for yourself. Uh, so I we'll think we'll, we'll provide some links to that when we finish. Yes, today. we will. Uh, so if, uh, to proceed here, we're going to click on Create New Release. So every time you do an update for your game, 
uh, you'll be asked to enter all these updates. So the first time you create the initial release, you have to enter this, uh, the same uh, values here. But when you do updates, uh, the existing values can be unchanged. The app name, the selling details and services and so on. So I'll go to each of these, uh, but I won't change anything because uh, a, lot of, a lot of these values are unchanged. So it says here that Gallon Glider is reserved for this app. Uh, I can go ahead and reserve another name by changing it, but initially you will be adding the name. Uh, the selling details here, it says that there's a, a price here. If I click on this, you'll see several different price points starting from free to uh, 99 cents all the way up to $999. If only I could sell apps at, at $1,000. Yeah, so if you feel you have an app that is worth $1,000, uh, feel <laughs> free, but I would highly recommend uh, starting from a low price point, either a dollar or uh, just for free if you want to get your name out there. Uh, there are also several uh, uh, countries that you can make your game available in. And again, it's totally up to you what you want to do. Uh, there are some certification steps that are involved. Uh, again, this is completely up to you. I've chosen a couple of countries. I've chosen my own category and subcategory. And finally, uh, I click Save to proceed. So I'm actually going to click Back. Or on the left, you'll see that I have the same links available. I'll click Services from here instead of clicking Back. Uh, so there's some additional services you can choose. Uh, I have not used the screen, so I will skip to the next step. And there's an age rating. Again, if it's suitable for young children, you can start with 3 plus to make it the most accessible, all the way up to 18 plus, depending on the content. Uh, cryptography is something that uh, may not be needed by a new developer or for someone just starting out. Again, um, if it doesn't use any cryptography or encryption, you can say no. And finally, we come to packages. Now, if you recall earlier, we are talking about the app package folder. So here, you can actually browse to the local file that we had created. Um, so I, will, I can go ahead and select one of these. I can click Open. And I can use that to replace uh, one of these existing um, files here. So what it does essentially completely deletes what, what I have out there in the marketplace, replaces it with my new version, and I can uh, go ahead and hit Save to include that. Now, you notice here it does say, we uploaded the package in green text. It means that uh, your package file has been uploaded successfully. It's, it's going to be replaced. You can click Save if you would like to replace it. Uh, in this case, I'm not going to click Save. I'll just go and go to Description and show you what that looks like. In this case, I have a small description for my game. And I also have some screenshots. Uh, if you recall, we took a bunch of screenshots earlier. This is the place to add them. I can go ahead and click on a graphic to add new images, add additional images, or delete the existing ones. Uh, so again, for the first time, you'll notice these are all blank. Uh, the only reason you're seeing these filled in is because I've created uh, this game before and I've already uploaded it for my game. Uh, since this is obviously a Flappy Bird clone using the Flapping Bird template, uh, I've included uh, some keywords that uh, might be useful to find this game. And I have some uh, information that says derived from the Flapping Bird sample and Construct 2 uh, to give a shout out to the folks at Sarah. And finally, I have some other required images, such as the promotional images and uh, some contact information, which is my Microsoft email address. So that, in a nutshell, is uh, the steps that you have to follow in order to associate your app with the App Store, uh, the Windows Store Microsoft, uh, capture some screenshots, and create packages for your app. Uh, we talked about creating logo and splash graphics. Uh, so uh, if you look at my screen again, you'll notice that I've highlighted some of the uh, placeholder graphics I showed you earlier. Again, if you forget where those are, the screenshot shows you that uh, it's within the Windows subfolder in the Images subfolder, and uh, the screenshots can be replaced uh, with your own version. And finally, we talked about publishing the app package. Uh, we went through each of the steps to publish it uh, to the Windows Store, and we also uploaded the package, which was one of the most important steps. And finally, let's come to Windows Phone. So before we wrap up, uh, I wanted to highlight that it's very easy to do uh, all these stuff we just did for Windows, uh, for Windows Phone 8 as well. Now, uh, uh, James, you've published about Windows and Windows Phone 8. How was that experience for you? Yeah, actually, it's a, it's a little quicker and a little easier, I think, for Windows Phone. So it's a good thing that you covered the Windows 8 side because it covers some of the steps that you don't even need to walk through in Windows Phone. So we've, we've walked through everything that you'll need to publish to both platforms. It's very simple. You go into Windows Phone, you'll reserve a name, and you'll do your details and description and promotional images and stuff like that, and it's pretty straightforward. Yep. Uh, so again, back in my screen, we'll notice that the dashboard for Windows Phone looks just like uh, the live website we looked at a few minutes ago. And the Submit app screen only shows a couple of things that are required. And uh, there are some optional things that are off the screen. And uh, what better way to look at it than to actually view the live website. So back at the Windows Dev Center, I'm going to go ahead and click on Dashboard, click on Windows Phone Store. And you'll notice that uh, if I go to Submit App, Again, there's the two required options. App Info shows you uh, the d required options you have to add for your app. And number two is where you upload and describe your package. 
There's some additional things like in-app advertising, market selection, custom pricing, and map services, and so on. Uh, these aren't things that uh, you may need for a very simple app per game. Uh, but uh, we did uh, talk about uh, in-app purchases and advertising other ways you can make your game uh, more profitable. Uh, this is not something that we'll be covering in detail in today's presentation. Uh, but you know, stay tuned to additional uh, information that uh, may become available at a later date where we'll have more updates. And uh, we also have our blogs. Uh, we'll be able to see some uh, URLs so you can visit. Uh, so with that, let me actually jump to the next slide, which will give you some more information. Uh, so on the web and via social media, I'll run through these screens really quick. Uh, you will have the option to download uh, this presentation uh, after viewing the pre uh, presentation display online. Uh, so that way you can get access to all the links. So don't worry about trying to write down all of these things uh, as you're watching the video. You can also pause the video uh, later on and uh, write these down if you want. But essentially from the top uh, to the bottom, we have the index page for Construct 2 on my blog, wakeupandcode.com. We cover many different game development topics, uh, but here I have an index of uh, links that may be useful. I have some basic step-by-step -step tutorials that explains in uh, extreme detail how you can publish and create uh, top-down shooters and uh, uh, flapping bird games and other similar games. And also the export and publish steps you've seen are also available on another blog post. And again, if you don't want to write all the uh, details, detailed URLs, just start off with wakeupandcode.com slash construct2. And next we have the Facebook group that James had mentioned earlier. Uh, he's been kind enough to co-admin that with me. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, hundreds of actually, members from all around the world. Uh, again, it's on Facebook, Construct2 Indie Developers. And the name is uh, slash group slash Construct2Devs. And uh, if you have additional questions, what better way uh, than to join Sarah's official forums? A lot of discussions going on there. And again, uh, I've mentioned uh, the Sarah folks a couple of times. Here are the links uh, to their tutorials that we have derived from. And finally, uh, we have some templates and published games. Uh, James, you want to take this? Yeah, so we, we wanted to share, uh, we've talked about a lot of stuff that we've done and we wanted to share those links here. So my GitHub page is github.com slash jqquick223. Again, when the slides come out, you guys can just click and go straight there. But on that page, you can go to, I think there's a folder for Construct2 templates, and then you can find my game and my trivia template there. Um, and then we've got the links to our games that we've published uh, that we kind of worked on for, uh, that kind of tie in with this, uh, this presentation today. So the, the What's Your Capital app is one that I built on top of my trivia template. So there's the link for it on Windows 8 and Windows Phone. The Golden Ball game that, that we all had so much fun spending an hour working through is published on Windows 8 Windows Phone as well. And then you've got your Gallant Glider that we just, uh, that we just saw and then the Ninja Cat Runner as well. Yep, uh, so we provide a bunch of bit.ly links and tiny URLs that you can uh, click on or write down. Uh, but again, if you download the presentation, you'll have access to all of these. And if you remember the name, you can just go to uh, the Microsoft Store. For example, if I go to uh, Store right now, you'll notice that here is Golden Ball available on the website, and you can go ahead and uh, install that. And uh, if you uh, install it on your local machine, you can try it out, uh, rate it, uh, and try and beat the high scores. All right, so I think... That wraps it up for today. Does that finish our fourth and final module? Yes, it does. We hope you enjoy the four modules and developing games with Contract 2. Yep, so we encourage you guys to take the polls. Let us know how we did. We would love to hear your feedback. Hopefully, we will be back sometime soon. And in the meantime, thanks again for joining, and we'll see you later. Yep, thank you very much. Hey there, uh, welcome to Developing Games with Construct 2 Jumpstart. My name is Jahad Chowdhury, I'm Technical Evangelist for Microsoft, and I have my colleague James Quick here. Yep, so I'll go ahead and do my introductions. Um, as you can see on the screen, and as you had said, my name is James Quick. I'm a Microsoft Technical Evangelist in South Florida. South Florida, for me, my territory is basically Miami, Fort Lauderdale, uh, that whole area. On the top of the screen right now, you can see my Twitter handle is at jquickwit, W-I-T. My Microsoft email is jaquick at microsoft.com. My blog is blogs.msdn.com slash quick underscore thoughts. Underscore is kind of hard to see, but it is there. And I've got several additional posts and videos and stuff about Construct 2 that you can find there as well. If you are local to the South Florida area, uh, my meetup is the Miami Fort Lauderdale Windows app developers. I have to make sure I remember that correctly when I say it. Um, and then my YouTube channel where I also have additional videos on Construct 2 
is a bit.ly link that's JQ YouTube. So as technical evangelists, Shahed and I more or less teach mobile application development for Windows 8 and Windows Phone. And in this case, we're really concentrated on making games with Construct 2. Yep. Um, so my background, and similar to yours, is I have several games published, built in Construct 2, on Windows Phone and Windows 8. And then I'm a co-admin on Shahed's group on Facebook, the Construct 2 Facebook group. So with that, I'll pass it over and let you do your introductions. Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, my name is Shahad Jodhri, and uh, I'm from the D.C. metro area. So uh, if you're around D.C., Maryland, Virginia, you'll find me doing a lot of presentations up there. I'm also uh, doing, traveling up and down the East Coast as well. Uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, I also have an indie dev background, although I've been doing corporate uh, web development uh, in my main career. I've been doing some indie games in my spare time. And during that time, I've been uh, uh, publishing games on Xbox 360, also on Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8. Uh, so recently started working on Construct 2, which brought me here today. Um, I've also published several articles and tutorials on Construct 2. Some of them are derived from what Sura provides on their site. Uh, Sura.com is where you can get Construct 2. Uh, and we'll provide more information on that later in the presentation, but uh, to get you started, you can also go to my blog, wakeupandcode.com, uh, where you can see a lot of tutorials uh, on Construct 2 and other game development. And, and finally, uh, I have a meetup page uh, where you can go and visit um, and attend any of my events that are coming up uh, within the DC metro area. Awesome. Let me get that to switch. All right, so uh, what are we going to do today? We talked about we're doing developing games with Construct 2, but how are we going to break down this jump start? So we're basically going to have four different modules. We will have uh, one is going to be Introduction to Construct 2 and Building Your First Game. So we'll, we'll download Construct 2, walk through it, and do the first tutorial. Um, part two will be expanding your game, so expanding on the knowledge that you learn in part one with a, another demo where we'll add more features and things like that to, to build a more complex and like publish ready kind of game. Yep. Um, and then you want to cover uh, part three and four? Uh, sure. So in module three, I'll be talking about exploring the different Construct 2 templates that we have available. And uh, these are uh, templates that come with Construct 2 and also some templates that uh, my colleague James here himself has built. Uh, so I'll talk about how you can look at uh, one of these templates and build your own version of the game and use your experience to build a complete game from scratch as well. Uh, and finally, we'll wrap up with uh, talking about exporting and publishing your game. So you can export the game either to the web or to one of the popular app platforms. And we'll go specifically into publishing for Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8 by the popular universal app format. And we'll talk more about the cross-platform capability here shortly. Yes. Uh, one of the big features about Construct 2. All right. So uh, let's set some expectations for the audience here. Who are we looking for? Who would be qualified to kind of take this course and get something out of it? And the target audience that we're looking at is, is really anyone. So anyone that we work with from students to developers, professional developers, um, can get involved. I've worked with uh, students as low as eighth grade. I think, Shahed, you've worked with students that are even younger than that. Right. So I do uh, teach some students uh, over the weekends. Uh, uh, they're 10 to 12 year old mostly. They're, we do have a seven year old as well learning construct too. I've also taught high school students and growing up pro uh, professionals who have day jobs and they come out to my presentations to learn construct too. Uh, at different ages, the teaching style is different, but the tool itself is very useful, very easy to get into, and it does teach you programming constructs, uh, so to speak, yep. uh, so you can get ready for the next level of game development. Exactly. So you're looking at an age range from seven is the youngest that you worked with yep. to basically any age, right? So it's a, it's a large age group. And then if we talk about what are the prerequisites for this course, there really aren't any. So you don't need a, a background in computer science. You don't need a background in making games. None of that. Anyone, everyone, any age can get involved and get started, right? Yep. So uh, you want to take a slide on the MVA community before we get started? Uh, sure, so if you're watching this video today, you're on the Microsoft Virtual Academy website, also known as MVA. Uh, so here, as you can see in the next slide, uh, it talks about how many uh, available users there are, uh, registered users there are on the website, and there are a lot of different videos with different technical things you can learn from Microsoft, and they're all free. All you have to do is register, and uh, as you're watching the videos, you can also earn points. And just for this event, you can earn 50 MVA points. And if you go to this URL that's provided, aka.ms slash MVA voucher, you can enter this code, GameDevCons2, and that'll allow you to uh, get some points right away. So try it out, check it out, and check out the other videos as well. 
Awesome. And I think we need to update the slide because last I heard, we are now over 2 million registered users. Yes, the uh, number's growing all the time. Yeah, so that's a pretty big deal. And also with the, with the 50 MVA points that you get for this event, um, if you want something to compare to, I was actually watching a video on MVA yesterday and I was offered three points for the course. So that's a big difference from 50 to three. So I encourage you guys to, you're already here, but uh, spread the word and, and tell people about the video. All right. So the first module uh, is gonna be, as we said earlier, the introduction to Construct 2, and then building your first game, the first tutorial. And that first demo will be a top-down go shooter. So this is a tutorial that you can find on their website, Skira, or excuse me, Sira. And I've, I've done that for a long time, but apparently it's pronounced Sira. Yep. Uh, S-C-I-R-R-A.com. Uh, you can find this tutorial and follow along, but we'll do it hands-on here. <coughs> So in this module, we will do a more general intro to, to game making, why do it, how to do it, um, how to make money, stuff like that. We will do an introduction to Construct 2, where to download it, what it looks like, how to use it, and then we will do the hands-on demo that we were talking about just a second ago. Yep. So here's our intro to game making uh, portion of this module. And so really, the, the big thing to think about here is that Almost everyone has a mobile device, right? We carry around cell phones, we carry around tablets, laptops, computers that we can play games on. So mobile devices are everywhere, and because of that, games are everywhere, right? I don't know how often you play games on your phones, but I, I carry my, mine around and play pretty frequently. Yeah, I always have a couple of games installed where uh, I can whip it up and play a quick game. Yeah. Uh, if I'm even sitting in the waiting room, waiting for a train, something else like that. Yeah, and I, uh, traveling, sitting in the waiting room, anything, I do the same thing. Yep. Um, so some of the, Game examples that I'll talk about, some successful and popular games, are Flappy Bird, um, Words with Friends, Candy Crush, and Angry Birds. And I'll kind of get a little more detailed about the stories behind each in a second, but those are some very popular games that most of you out there have probably heard of and probably played as well. Right. And the key thing there is they're very simple 2D games. Now, when we look at the games that have been building over the years on these modern consoles, we see a lot of complex 3D games. And while those are flourishing, we've also seen this resurgence of 2D games as well. Yep. And that actually uh, leads into my talk about Flappy Birds. But first, why make mobile games? Um, so one point that I, I didn't put on here is just from a creative creativity standpoint, from, from just something to do, something fun to do. If I walk into a classroom of students and I say, who wants to make a game today? That's a pretty easy sell. Who doesn't want to make a game, right? Um, so just a, a genuine interest in making games is pretty simple. Um, and then a more practical reason is money. So everyone wants to make money. How do you do that? And there's three main ways to make money um, in games and apps, but obviously here we're talking about games. And the first one is ads. So Flappy Birds has a very interesting story and there's a lot of details and rumors about it, but basically it's a one touch game, a one click game. So you click to raise your player or else he's falling and you're dodging pipes. Pretty simple. We could make that game and we'll see more specifically in a couple of hours is about how long it would take to make that game, right? Yep. And there's rumors of why the creator did this, but he pulled the game from the store, and at the time he pulled it, he was making $50,000 a day in advertising. So I don't know how much we make per day, but that's a lot more than what we make, right? Right. Um, so a lot of money to be made there because he had so many users and they were clicking on ads and stuff. The second main way to earn money with games is in-app purchases. So my favorite example here is Candy Crush, and my girlfriend would be mad at me for calling her out, but um, in Candy Crush, you can, when you lose your five lives, you can pay a dollar to, to keep playing or wait until they regenerate. And my girlfriend doesn't have any problem spending a couple dollars here and there to get five lives to continue playing. I don't know how much total she spent, but if you think about uh, the millions of users who play, just spending a dollar or two per month, that's a lot of money that they're making. Right. And I see the same things with uh, other games like Clash of Clans, mm -hmm. uh, which is also popular. It's not a 2D game, but it does have in-app purchases, and it's really popular with uh, a lot of different age groups as well. Yep, and several of my friends play that as well. So, um, The third option is just simply to sell your game. So we've basically, with the first two, we're kind of talking about free games that have other ways to monetize. Uh, the third way is to actually sell your game, and Angry Birds is one example. If you look in the games on Windows Phone, it's one of the top grossing paid games. Uh, they also have a lot of marketing behind it, so they have a series of uh, like clothes, t-shirts and sweaters, stuffed animals, a physical game. My nephews have all of it and they love it. 
So there's there's other ways to make money in addition to just the game itself, right? Yep. Um, another reason you might be interested, especially as a student, is something you can point to on a resume. So if you imagine applying to a university out of high school and you've got a game on your resume and that you can point to it in a store and say, I built that, that's kind of a cool thing. Um, in addition, uh, professional developers, they can have something maybe that shows their more creative side. So they, they write code all day, but they also can be creative and create a game and stuff like that. Right. So I wouldn't underestimate how important and useful that could be. Yeah, a lot of the time people wonder about making a complete game and they don't have the time or the resources to build a, a very complex game. So they, uh, if you look at uh, simpler 2D games that you can build very quickly, you can still build something that's complete and publish it to the store and use that as your portfolio as opposed to saying that you were a part of a larger team uh, that you worked at some other company. So this is something you can show to prove your worth. Right, and Flappy Bird, we'll see in a few hours, it will be the perfect example of that yep. for how quickly you can do it. So I want to, just to kind of grab your attention, I want to do some stats, um, some wowing stats of um, mobile games, how much money they're making, stuff like that. So uh, there's over 100 million US gamers, almost a third of the population, right? That's an incredible amount of people that play games on their phone. 34% of the top 100 grossing apps in the App Store are using the freemium model. So that's when we talk about games that are free and you can app, or monetize in different ways. The mobile gaming industry is predicted to reach $54 billion by 2015. That's just, that's an insane amount of money. So if you think about one of the reasons for developing, you want to go out and you want to get a portion of that that money, right? That's a, it's a big chunk of change that you could potentially get into. Yep, and then when you're looking at these different uh, markets that are available uh, with Microsoft's platforms and the competing platforms, one of the things Microsoft started offering recently is the universal format uh, for publishing to both Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8 and coming soon for Xbox One as well. And this lets you use mostly the same code base to publish to uh, more than one platform. So basically today, the tutorials you'll see will allow you to publish uh, one game uh, into multiple marketplaces at the same time. And this is this makes it really easy for you to publish uh, to multiple platforms with less effort. Yep. Um, so over 80% of all revenue by mobile in 2012 was from games. So think of all the money that people spend in apps and, and advertising and in-app purchasing. 80% of that comes from games. Um, they're the most popular app category, as you might expect. More people are looking to play games than they are to have like productivity tools and stuff like that. Um, and lastly, 70 to 80% of all mobile downloads come from games. So the portion of, of money and games, or excuse me, money and downloads that come from games is very high um, in contrast to just apps in general. Yep. So now uh, we've talked about game making in general, why you want to do it, how much money you can make, what the potential is. Uh, but now let's go ahead and dive into uh, Construct 2. So let's do our introduction and we will walk through, we'll download Construct 2, we'll pull it down, we'll see what it looks like, how to use it, and then we'll do our hands-on demo that we talked about. Yep. So what is Construct 2? Yes, and what is Construct, Construct 2? Yeah, <laughs> so we've talked a lot about it, but we haven't really said many specifics about what it is. But Construct 2 is a powerful, groundbreaking HTML5 game creator designed specifically for 2D games. It allows anyone to build games, no coding required. So we've talked about the no coding required. There's no prerequisites for this course. Anyone can get involved. But a couple of things stand out to me in that, that first statement, the first of which is its groundbreaking HTML5 game creator. So it creates games in HTML5 and, and JavaScript, your web technologies. And then the second part is it's designed for 2D games. So there are other tools that are more adequate and geared towards 3D, like Unity, which I think we have a, a course coming up or already out on Unity, I'm not sure. Uh, yep, it's uh, uh, being broadcast in September sometime. Okay, so keep an eye out for that as well. Uh, but here we're talking about 2D games with Construct. So if you're looking to download Construct 2, and it's a free download, um, you can go to Sierra, Sierra's website, S-C-I-R-R-A.com, and on the screenshot here, you can see the download button download it, run the EXE, it's pretty straightforward. I don't think we need to run through that here. Um, now, is that free for everyone? Is there a paid version? 
Yeah, so you want to talk about their, it's free to download and everything we'll do today is included in the free version, but there's a, a couple of different tiers and if you want to talk about how that pricing works. Uh, sure, so uh, if you go to the download section of the website, you'll notice that, that there's multiple uh, versions available. Uh, download the free version to start with, uh, and once you're uh, getting into the th swing of things and you start your own business, you're selling games, uh, you can buy a personal license for yourself or a business license if you're running a business. But again, as we discussed, uh, the free version will let you do a lot of the things uh, that you need to do, and it'll let you do everything that you see in the examples today. Yep. Yeah, it'll cover everything we do today. We do have uh, personal licenses, yep. but everything um, that, they, that you guys do out there will look the same, and it'll work the same as what we do. Yep. Exactly. So cross-platform is the biggest feature about Construct 2. What does cross-platform mean? Or what does cross-platform mean? It means that you can take one game, kind of like you were saying with Universal Apps, and you can export it to different platforms. So Android, iOS, Windows Phone, Windows 8, all those different platforms you can get to through Construct 2. So you can do it, you can export directly with the Universal App to Windows 8 and Windows Phone, or you can basically export a HTML5 website, go through a technology like PhoneGap to indirectly get packages for Android, iOS, stuff like that. So yep. really, you can hit any platform with a game created in Construct 2. Right, because a lot of the time I hear from uh, our audience that uh, maybe the people they know don't have uh, Windows phones or Windows 8, they might have Macs or some other platform. Uh, so what we do is we let them know that they can still publish to our platforms, but uh, make it available to competing platforms as well uh, using minimal effort. So you'll find that Universal Apps is a very quick way to get your game out there. But if you'd like to have it on multiple platforms as well, uh, you'll notice that uh, it's not that difficult. Yeah, but I will, I will mention one thing. It, you have a more direct route to get to our platform through Construct 2. Yep. Um, you have to go kind of in a roundabout way to get to the other platform. So it's something to keep in mind. It is easier, and that's why we focus on it. It's free, it, it comes directly to our platform, and it's a great tool. Yep. Right. So I want to do, I've got a couple of slides of examples of successful studios that have used um, Construct 2 to build their games. The first of which is a studio that's local to my area, local to South Florida, and that is CNG Studios, and they have published over 50 games in Windows 8 and Windows Phone stores. So they've got 50, 51, I think, in each store. They have a total of over 250,000 downloads, which is a, a great big number. If you, if you look at successful number of downloads, that's pretty successful. Um, and if you're interested, you can check out their website at cngstudios.com um, on the screen here. And then I've got a couple of screenshots of if you search for their studio, CNG Studios, in the Windows Phone and Windows 8 stores, you can see the list of apps here. And they've got, again, 50 that you can scroll through for a long time. Uh, but a great example of very successful and good-looking games that they've created in Construct 2. Yep. And that's a great way to get your name out there. Instead of ha just having one or two games, uh, you can have multiple games, and that way when people search for uh, one or two of your games, they can easily find related titles. Yeah, and that's exactly what they've seen with their games is after the first three, four, five got out there when they would release more, the downloads kind of went up faster, right? Because they were, they were cross-referencing, they had links to their other apps in the store, stuff like that, so it really picks up the more you have. Yeah. Um, and I think I'll let you do uh, this example here. The Unurban Tech? Sure. Uh, so here we have a slide about a developer in Pennsylvania. Uh, Jarrell Jones, a 39-year-old freelance app developer, had unfortunately lost his home uh, in a fire accident. So he and his family got together and continued to make games uh, full-time uh, to raise some money. And they've been able to release a couple of games out in the marketplace. Uh, this one, the example you see right here is Soft Kitty HD, available now on Windows 8. It's a retro platformer. Uh, with pixel graphics, uh, 2D cat running around, shooting enemies. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for you to uh, get some inspiration uh, to see how people are uh, building games not only in their spare time, but even when uh, things are not working as planned in life, uh, you can just uh, get together with your friends and family, make something cool, and at the same time make a few bucks as well. Uh, if, to get some more information, I did do a Q&A with the developer. If you go to wakeupandcode.com at the URL shown, uh, you'll get more information about his uh, uh, ideas and his games. Yep, and that's just that's just another example of how any age group can get involved, right? He was doing yep. this with his kids, yep. and then I don't know his exact age, but he's an adult that, um, I don't know, it shows, it's, oh, 39, we have it on here. So it, it shows a range of people that can get involved. Exactly. Right? Perfect. So now let's go ahead and let's actually talk about Construct 2, um, what it looks like. And here we have a screenshot of the IDE of Construct 2. And really quickly, I'll kind of run through this. The top, you have your toolbar, pretty standard in a lot of different apps. You have your file, 
tab, you have a view tab. Um, the main thing we'll talk about here, see if I can get this to work, is this run layout here. That's where we're actually gonna test our game. So we'll do that anytime we wanna test and it'll open up the browser and run our game in the browser. On the left-hand side, we have the properties window and that shows the properties for whatever thing, object, layout is selected, wherever it is. Um, in the middle of the screen, we have our actual layout, which will show visually what our game looks like, and we can rearrange and resize and stuff like that. And then we have the event sheet next to it, uh, which is gonna be the logic for our game. So it, it'll be no graphical, uh, no graphics or anything, just kind of shows the, the logic for the game. Yep. And I'd like to add that if you have used any of those visual uh, IDEs, such as Visual Studio, yep. uh, you would have a similar uh, properties panel that shows you uh, the context sensitive properties of whatever selected. So you have an object in your game selected, the properties panel will show you just uh, the properties for that object. Yep, exactly. Uh, yeah, so I, I wanna walk through this just in case, but you've, most people are probably familiar with something like this. Yep. Um, so on the uh, right hand side, you have a projects pane, similar to Visual Studio, like you said. It'll show you all the files that you have in your project. It also has a layers tab, so different layers in your game, background, foreground, game, stuff like that, you'll see those there. And in the bottom right, you'll see the objects pane, show you all the objects that you have in your game. Yep. So let me, I've got Construct 2 open. So this is, uh, when you download Construct 2, you pull it open initially, this is what it will look like. You see some of those panes I'm talking about, but the first, thing we, the first thing we need to do is create a project, right? So under the File tab, we can just go to File New and we have all of these different things we can choose from, and we'll talk about some of them later on, but for now we'll just do a new empty project. And I'll close the start page. So here is basically everything that we just talked about from the screenshot. We have the properties, the layout and event sheet, the projects tab, and the objects pane as well. Yep. Uh, so let me go back over to the slides. And the first thing I wanna talk about We'll talk about some of the different aspects and, and things that you include in Construct 2. The first thing I want to talk about is objects. So what are objects? Objects could be a lot of different things. They could be a background, a sprite, an image for a character, um, text. They could be a lot of different things, and we'll get to, to use several of them here shortly. Um, but to add an object, you just want to double click on your layout or right click and select to add an object. So let me go over back over to Construct 2 open my layout page, and here in my layout, I can simply double click, and it gives me the options for all the different objects I can add, so I can scroll through those. And we'll add some of those um, in a second. So, uh, we got objects. Behaviors are going to be, they're like built-in logic for, for different objects, and we'll see a lot of different behaviors throughout the day, but uh, some examples are bullet behavior, it just basically makes things move with a constant motion. Uh, the scroll to behavior scrolls and follows the player as it moves around in a level. And then there's destroy outside layout for if something gets outside the layout, you wanna destroy it, it's pretty straightforward. That's one of the good things about the names is that they're very descriptive about right. what they do, right? Uh, just to cl so clarify something about that name. So destroy outside layout, although you see the word destroy, you're not gonna see something being destroyed visually. Uh, so in code, normally when something is destroyed, it's no longer in memory. So in a game development tool like Construct 2, destroying something, just to clarify, means that it's no longer being used in memory, it's no longer visible, so it just sort of disappears. So you don't see anything visually exploding. And if you do want to add explosions, you do have to add that as a separate explosion. Good point. Yep. So your layout versus your event sheet. We saw both of them kind of in the center of Construct 2. The layout is, is a prearranged layout of objects. So it's gonna be how they're arranged, what size, what orientation they have, that sort of stuff. And then your event sheet is going to be all the logic for the things inside of your layout, right? Yep. Um, logic. So you'll have, you'll have a list of events and actions. Let me swipe over one more time. So your events and actions, how, do, how does the event sheet work? You basically declare an event um, and you define how the game works using a logical block system. So this is kind of the drag and drop kind of thing instead of actually writing code. Um, but an event is basically a condition. So an example is on start of layout, when your game starts, that's a condition. And then when that event is triggered, it will execute, your game will execute whatever actions come to the right of that event. 
Um, so they'll, they're triggered by a corresponding event and you can have multiple actions per event. So on start of layout, I wanna start moving to the right, I wanna add my score every second, whatever it is. Um, it's always events and actions, right? right? So I guess that would correlate to, in, if you were programming a game, uh, if conditions, uh, where you yeah. have if else logic would be your conditions that you see here, and your actions in this case would be the statements that appear within those if else blocks. Exactly. And you can have, you can have nested events and if this and this or that, those kind of things, you can get creative, but the basics are, are pretty simple. Yep. So one, one thing that kind of confuses me when I, when I started learning game development was the X and Y coordinates are a little different than what we're used to. So when you're in your typical math class, your origin is zero, zero, your bottom left corner, positive X is to the right, positive Y is up, uh, but in computer graphics, you're starting at the top left, so positive X is to the right and positive Y is down. It's yep. a, little, a little weird, but something you just kind of have to get used to. Right, and that relates to the way uh, the screen is written to. So let's say you turn on any monitor or TV screen, uh, the screen starts writing from the top left corner, uh, mm -hmm. so that way it relates to how graphics is done. Yep. Uh, also, one thing to notice is if you're adding a tiled background image uh, to your game, uh, that starts out at uh, the top left when you're placing it, but if you add a sprite, uh, as you may recall, the coordinate system actually picks out the middle of the graphic, and that's good to know yep. when you're placing things on the screen. Good point. All right, so we've been talking a lot of theory about Construct 2. Let's, let's get hands-on and let's do the demo. Let's yep. get down to the top-down shooter. Exactly. Sound good? And again, shout out to Sarah. We do have some links at the end that provides a link to the original tutorial done uh, for the uh, top-down shooter yep. and the Flapping Bird clone we're gonna see later on. Uh, so you notice it's that Flapping Bird, not Flappy Bird. Uh, that's the name that they use for the tutorials. So we're gonna build upon those. And again, we have the credits at the end, but again, thanks to Sarah for providing these free tutorials. Yep. So in our top-down shooter, we're going to insert objects, add behaviors, have events, um, add some additional game functionality, have instance variables. If you're a programmer, you know what that is. If not, you will learn, don't worry. Uh, we're gonna keep score, and then we'll create an HUD, which is a heads-up display that basically displays your score and time and whatever else you wanna display. So inserting objects. Uh, we talked about really quickly, um, you can double-click, choose an object, give it a name, put it in there. Pretty straightforward. The objects we will add are background, background object, and then sprite objects for player, monster, bullet, and explosion, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to Construct 2. And let's see, I'm gonna change this layout size. So if I select my layout on the right, notice the properties changes over here on the left. And I can come in and just change the layout size to, let's see what that size is. 1280 by 1024. And let me zoom out a little bit. If you're looking at your layout and you can't see the whole thing, you can either control minus or control scroll with your mouse and kind of zoom out. So here you'll see that I've got a little dashed line and there that is actually the window size different than the layout size. Right. So the window size is what you actually see in your game and then your layout might be bigger. Right. Right. Another term people have used in other tools is the viewport. So okay. basically the viewport is what follows you around, what you see on the screen, and your layout being the screen can be bigger than the viewport. Exactly. Um, so actually, and I can, I can see that if I click on my project, it'll show my properties on the left. Window size is 854 by 480, and then my layout size is 1280 by 1024, so it's bigger. Yep. So the first thing we're gonna do is add a tiled background. So I'm gonna double, I just double clicked um, inside of my layout and I can um, scroll down and find tiled background. The easiest thing to do is just start typing. That's how I find all of my objects. So when I don't have to scroll, I just start typing. Yep. Um, and I'll leave the name, I'll just call it background. All right, so by default it does give you a name, but again, it's useful to have unique names. Right. Uh, if you, in case you forget here, uh, you can actually change the name after you've added something. Yep. So I'll insert this, then I get a little crosshair, which asks me where I want to input it. And if I click, then I, now I get the image editor and I can go and choose an image to use. So I'm gonna load an image from file up here. And I've got background one already uh, here for me. So I'm gonna select that and then close this box. And now I see it on my, on my screen, I can drag it around. And if you look over on the left, you'll see the position move when I readjust it. So I'm gonna set its position to 
zero, zero. We'll just put it in the top left. And then I'll make the size the same size as the layout, which is 1280 by 1024. And now what I want to do, since we have a background, I want to put that background on its own layer. So it's completely separate from the game layer, right? So it's two separate things. So I will, I'm going to come over to layer zero and I'll rename it to background. And then I want to press this little lock here. And what this does is everything on that lay, <coughs> excuse me, that layout now is locked so I can't touch it. So now if I'm messing with other things, I can't change that background. All right, that's really useful. Yeah, it is. It's very useful when you have a lot of different objects and layers going around. So now I will add, I'll do this little plus mark up here, add another layer, and I'll rename it to game. And since I have it selected, I can now add objects to that layer instead of the background. So let's see. I can, what, which objects did we say we wanted to add? Uh, so we could add the sprite object. Sprite, so we had the player as one. Yep. So I'll, I'll, do, I'll select sprite and then name it player. Click insert and then load an image just like we did before. And I've got player here and then exit out. And now I need to, and you can see it, I can drag it around and move it. Then I'll do the same thing for um, monster, or is that, what, is that what we call it, monster? Uh, sure, monster or ghost. So monster, whatever, Yep. Um, insert, and we'll choose the, yep, monster. Choose the monster object. And then we can add our bullet and explosion. And we're not gonna see those initially, so we can put them off to the side, not right. in, our, in our layout. So I'll just come out here a little wider and do sprite and bullet. And that's where you'll see one of the behaviors that's called bound to layout is useful. So if the player is bound to the layout, they can't leave this main screen. So we can still leave exactly. things like bullets and explosions outside. Yep. So we've got our bullet, and then I'll select his graphic. They've got a little bullet graphic. There we go. And I'm going to drop him, if I can, drop him off to the side so we don't see him initially. Yep. And then we'll do one more. Sprite and explosion is the last one. And then insert and do him off to the side as well. And we've got this explosion here. So I think we've got all of our objects added in. And the next thing we wanna do is add behaviors for those objects. So the behaviors that we're gonna add, and again, these are predefined, um, predefined logic for our, for our objects, right? Yep. Um, for the player, we're gonna have the eight direction object. It allows you to use the keyboard to move left and right the scroll to behavior, which follows the player around in the layout, and the bound to layout, which like you said, keeps that player confined to that layout. The bullet object will have a bullet behavior. Yep. Who would have ever thought that, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then a destroy outside layout, which we talked about. If we're shooting a lot of bullets and they're going outside to save memory, we want to be able to delete them or destroy them when they get outside so we're not taking up too much memory. Right. The monster will also have the bullet behavior, so it's using it just as constant motion and eventually it will kind of track our player, just move towards our player. And then the explosion will have the fade behavior, which basically takes one variable that you can change, and it's the time it takes to fade out completely. So it'll start and then kind of fade out. Right, right. so if you normally did a destroy for the explosion, it would just disappear. Mm -hmm. But instead, if you decided to uh, make it fade away uh, with this behavior, it would fade away immediately as it appears. Yep, exactly. So now I'm, I'm back into Construct 2, and I'm going to select my player object from the objects pane. And then on the left, I can see now there's a, a place for behaviors. So I click on behaviors, I get a little dialog box, there's a plus mark. And which ones do we want here, did I say? Eight direction. Eight direction, so that's for movement. And again, I'll just start typing so I can find it. Eight direction and bound and to layout. Scroll two and bound to layout. Okay, yep. scroll two, add that one, and bound to layout. So I've got those three behaviors. I can just X this out, and then it'll show up these different properties for those behaviors on the left. Yep. And we have our monster, so let's do um, also, another way to find behaviors is to right-click on your object and uh, click behaviors from the little dialog box that pops up. Yep. So behaviors, and we want bullet here. Looks good. And then explosion, we want fade. So we'll fade that. And bullet, we want the 
bullet motion. <laughs> you have the bullet behavior. Exactly. Cool. So I think, does that cover all of our... We do have one more left. We do want the bullet to be destroyed outside the layout. Okay. Yep, exactly. And let's see. Behaviors and destroy outside layout. And I don't know if I put this in the slides. Let's see in our objects. So I missed one thing in inserting objects. We want a couple of objects that we're not going to be able to see, yep. like the keyboard and the touch object. And this allows for input from the user the, of the game to use their keyboard or touch on the screen and or click with the mouse. Right. So I've seen some questions on that about uh, the eight direction behavior. Since we added eight direction, it does allow some keyboard input. Mm -hmm. uh, but adding the keyboard and the touch objects actually allow us to uh, respond to events that happen. So let's say we want to do additional things when the keyboard is being touched or the touch screen is being touched. Uh, so adding these objects here allow us to uh, react to those events. Exactly. And one cool thing, uh, in the demo they actually use the, and we will too, we'll use the mouse object which tracks the mouse. The touch object will actually use touch on a touch screen, so this is touch screen. Yep. It will track that as well as a click on the mouse. Right. Um, so it's, it's more built for modern games where people could be playing with a keyboard and mouse or on a touch screen. Exactly. Right? All right, so let's go back over to the slides. Oh, we actually need to add those objects. So we will need the keyboard, and I'll just start typing. Keyboard object, again, gives us uh, the ability to track input from the keyboard. Yep. And then I'll double click again. And, and a good I'll thing get, to note here while you're adding that is uh, these, get, these are become available to all your layouts. So yep. when you had visible objects, they're available to uh, the layout you add them to, but these intangible objects, like keyboard and mouse, are always available to you. Exactly, so yeah, to clarify, these, these objects, keyboard and mouse, are invisible. We don't see them in the game. They just allow us to track the feedback from the user. Exactly. And they can be used in, in each layout and event sheet. Yep. All right. Cool. So we'll add that. Now we've got all the objects. I think we've got those covered. We have the behaviors for the visible objects. And then we've got the explosion and the bullet kind of off to the side so we don't see them initially. Right. And now we can start creating some extra, extra monsters if you want to show how that's done. Yeah, so um, if we select a monster that's already here, that is one instance of the monster object listed on the right. So if I want to make a copy, there's a couple of different ways I can do it. I can uh, click on it and then Control c copy, and then Control v and that gives me a crosshair where I can add another one. Yep. Or I can hold down Control and click and drag off of these monsters to create more. So I just click hold down control and then click and drag and now I've got all these monsters. Exactly. Yep. So we've got, we do have all of our behaviors. Now let's get into the event sheet. This is where we do our custom logic and we actually have to, for lack of a better term, write some code. But as we know, it's much simpler than that and easier for anyone to get involved and, and to do this. So uh, we talked about what events are. Um, the first event that we're going to do is to move our player towards the mouse every tick. And a tick, as you can see up here, is a 60th of a second. Mm -hmm. And that's what, the, that's what the game uses to check for events. It checks every tick, which is every um, 60th of a second. So let's go back over to Construct 2. And instead of doing the layout, we'll switch over to the event sheet. And pretty straightforward. The only thing we can do here is add event. We'll add event. And there you can choose events for each of the different objects, including system, which has more generic uh, system events. So we'll go into system. And then you can search for it or just start typing. And we'll do every tick. So that the event is every tick. And then the action will be to select a player. We want to set his. Uh, angle towards the position of the mouse. Right. Right. So we'll do player and then set angle toward. So set angle toward position. And then we'll need an X and Y coordinate. So it'll start at his X and Y coordinate and go to another X and Y coordinate. And that X and Y coordinate will be the mouse. Right. So and this syntax, uh, you'll notice those who are watching that mouse.x and mouse.y. Or it's called an object.property notation, which yep. is very familiar to those who are into object-oriented programming. Yep. And learning something like Construct 2 sets the stage for getting there. Exactly. So if, if you are a programmer, this is going to look very familiar to you. Um, if you're not, you'll get used to it. But you can start with whatever object you want. And IntelliSense will pop up. So there's mouse. Press Enter. It'll complete for me. Then if I do a dot, it'll show me all the different um, things that I can use, the properties of that object that I can use. Right. So I'll do mouse.x. 
and mouse dot y. And if I click done, and we haven't, I haven't run this yet, so let me actually run this in the browser. And now, um, if you see, this guy is rotating towards where my mouse is, yep. right? So now he's looking at me everywhere I go, and I can use the keyboard to move him around. And that's that eight direction. Yeah, this is the eight direction movement, and I can change his rotation and all that kind of stuff. And one weird thing we might have noticed, those monsters are taking off to the right yep, and off the screen. Motion. Yeah, that's the bullet motion by default. It goes uh, directly off to the right, so we'll fix that in a second. So let's go back over to the slides. So we have our first event. Now let's add some game, game functionality. So shooting, everyone likes to shoot, right? Um, so let's say that we want to shoot a bullet every time the user clicks. Yep. And um, once we shoot a bullet, if we hit a monster, we'll kind of, we'll do that explosion effect. And then um, in a minute, we'll make the monsters a little smarter. So the first thing is to go back over to the event sheet and add event and we want to track the mouse. So mouse on click and on left button click. Then we want to have the player spawn another object. Yep. And if I click in here, I can choose the bullet object. And it will be, we want it to be on layer one because that's our game layer, right? right? And then image point we can leave at zero and I'll talk about what that is in a second. So let me run this real quick. And if you see, the bullet seems to be coming out of my head, <laughs> right? Because that's where the origin is for the player. So we, wanna, we want it to come out of the tip of the gun, basically. Right. So if we go back over to our layout, we can select our player and then um, double click to open him. And then there is a set origin and image points. And if I click there, I can add a new image point and put that right at the tip of the gun, and that will be image point one. So I'll click out of there, that looks good. And then back in the event sheet, I can just double click to edit this action and do bullet point one. Yep. Since, I mean, excuse me, image point one that we just created. And then I'll run it again, and now it looks like it's coming right out of the gun. All right. And let's see, what did we have? The explosion effect. So now we need to do the collisions uh, if a bullet collides with a monster, what do we do? So let's go back over to Construct 2. Uh, collision events will be in whichever object is colliding with another. So bullet. And then it's on collision. So on collision with another object. And that object will be the monster. All right. And when, when that bullet hits the monster, we want to go into monster and destroy him. Then we want to uh, spawn another object, and right. uh, we'll have the explosion spawn out of the bullet. Right, so the, the bullet will still be there, but from where the bullet is, we will spawn the explosion object. Yep. And we'll spawn explosion, and that'll be still on layer one, and then bullet just has one image point. Yep. And then lastly, we want to destroy, destroy the, the bullet. bullet. Exactly. exactly. Uh, so bullet, destroy him as well. Let's go back over to the slides. So you might have noticed that the monsters were going way off to the right, and mm -hmm. it would be kind of hard to shoot them after they disappear. So let's say that on the start of the layout, let's say that set their direction to a random movement, so they can go any direction, and then we'll try to shoot them from there. Yep. So let's go back over to Construct 2, and let's say add event system, so a mm -hmm. system event on start of layout. And we'll add an action, and we'll do monster, and it's set angle of motion. And we want to set its angle to a random number, and they have a built-in random function, so we can just type random, it'll predict it for us, and then open paren and close paren, and inside of that, we'll give it a parameter of, basically, it'll give you a random number between zero and the number that we give it, yep. right? So we'll give it a random number between zero and 360. So now let's run this game again, and we should see they move pretty quickly. Let me <laughs> um, let me come back over to the layout and select my monster, and we'll change their speed to 80, something pretty slow, so we can see them moving around. Yep. Now let's run it again, and now they're moving. Now if I shoot, he explodes and disappears. So, so not Halo yet, but pretty cool for your first game, right? Yep. 
Is there something you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, I wanted to add something really quickly. Uh, so the explosion right now, uh, you can see a black background yep. around it. So I guess it'll tell us how we can get rid of that. By yeah, the gradient. The, so the explosion right now has that that black background, yep. and to get rid of it, you'll have to remind me where it is, actually. Uh, check out blend mode where it says normal right now. Yeah, blend and mode. check out the options that you have. And is it additive? Yep, additive okay. it is. Um, additive, now let's see the difference that that makes. So when I shoot, the explosion doesn't have that back, the black background, it looks a lot better right. the way it is right there. Awesome. Yep. So we made our monsters a little bit smarter. They're not quite there yet, they're just going in random directions. Um, but now we're gonna add instance variables. Instance variables, again, if you're a programmer, you know what it is. Um, if you're not, an instance variable is, let's say the example is health for the monster. So each monster has its own health. And if we shoot him five times or three times or whatever, then, then we can kill him instead of just killing him from one bullet. So each of those instances will have its own variable for right. health, right? Yep. So let's go in to construct again. Let's select monster. And on the side, there's a, a setting for instance variables. And we will add an instance variable, add new, and we'll call it health. And just to keep it a little easier for us, we'll do it initial value of three. Yep. Okay, okay. And then back in the event sheet, we're gonna say, instead of when the bullet hits the monster, instead of destroying that uh, monster by default, we can uh, do a monster and subtract and we can subtract from his health, subtract one from his health. So we'll start out three, two, then one, then zero. Yep. And okay, and then I'll just move, and you can drag and drop these and move them wherever you want. So I'll move that there, and then get rid of the destroy. So now when I shoot him, he will just continue to lose health. Yep. And then I can check to see if his health equals zero, then I wanna actually destroy him. Right, because right now we've removed the monster to destroy, so we right. still need a way to destroy the monster. Yep. So monster, and then compare instance variable. So it's an instance variable, health is. Mm -hmm. And if it is less than or equal to zero, then we can do the destroy now. Yeah. So monster, destroy, there we go. So and now while you're adding that, it's good to point out that we use less than or equal to zero because later on if we had more powerful weapons mm -hmm. and if uh, it causes the monster to be destroyed more quickly, then it could go below zero. Yep, exactly. So now, if you notice, I'm having to shoot them three times before they run away. Let's try that again. So he doesn't die on the first bullet, it takes three to kill him. And same thing here, right? Yep. So I think the next thing we're going to do is, oh, we're gonna keep score. So let's do um, a global variable for score, yep. and we will increase the score every time we shoot a monster. Great, and that should be the final thing we can do to uh, wrap up this game and uh, have yep. a fully playable game. Yep, so we can right click in our event sheet, add global variable, Type in score, and it'll start out at zero. Say okay. And then every time the bullet hits the monster, we can increase the score. Let's see where that is. System, uh, system add two, and we'll add two score. We can just add one to the score. Yep. And that'll keep track of the score. In the next tutorial, I'll actually show how to display the score. Right. Um, so let's see. So we're keeping track of the score. And then we could create another layer for the heads-up display. And the heads-up display is where we actually um, display health score, stuff like that. So let's go back here and to the layout. And under layers, we have the three, or excuse me, the two, the game and background. And we can add another layer and rename that to HUD, yep. which is where we'll display the, the score and uh, timer if we had one, stuff like that. So one thing to note here is that the, the heads up display, you don't want to move. So as we're moving through the level, the game and background are moving, but we don't want that, that heads up display to move, right? right? We want it to stay the same. So we can come over and edit its parallax and change it to zero, zero. And parallax just means that it won't scroll, right? right? It won't move around. And I've got a, got a slide on this, but, um, in a minute, but we just, we want that to stay the same while everything else rolls. Yep. And actually I'll go ahead and do, uh, to display the score, I'll go ahead and, and do that here and then we'll talk about it more in depth in the next one. Sure. So in, back in the layout, I can double click and add a text object and we'll call it score text. Insert that, I'll resize it. 
I won't make it too pretty. But I can come in and change it to say score. Maybe a little to the left so it's visible within the layout. Yep. Um, and I need to make sure this is on move to layer HUD so that way it doesn't scroll. Yep. And then we'll do the font size. We'll bump it up a little bit so people can see. And then we'll make it a nice yellow color so it's a little easier to see. So you can see it on there. So now it just says score, but we need to update that text every right. time we increment the score. Right. So we are incrementing the score when the bullet hits the monster. So after we add to the score, we can add action and do score text and set its text. And we want to set it to the word score, which is what's inside these uh, quotations. And then we want to tack on the value of the score variable. So to do value of a variable, you add the ampersand sign and then do the score variable. And it's a common way of uh, adding things to strings in other programming languages, yep. either the plus sign or ampersand. In this case, it's ampersand. Yep. Uh, so you've probably seen it in, in some other programming language, obviously, if you, if you are a programmer. But that's how it works. Your, your text goes inside of uh, quotations, and then you add the ampersand sign to add on a variable. Yep. So that's what it looks like. And then here's a slide on parallax um, that we talked about already. We talked about we don't want the heads-up display to move. And then the finishing touches, we want to create a monster every three seconds, and then we want to kill the player, unfortunately, if he hits a monster. So the last couple things we'll add is add event, and then we'll do a system every X seconds. So you can define how many seconds. So we'll do three. So every three seconds, we can create a monster. So we'll do system create object. And then we'll create a monster on layer one, which is our game layer. Yep. And we can do this at a random X coordinate. Let's see, a random X coordinate that is between zero and layout width, which is a built-in variable that we can use. Mm -hmm. And then the Y coordinate, we can, what should we do for a Y coordinate? Oh, uh, we can do a random one for that. Too. Okay, so a random uh, between zero and layout height. Yep. So that'll just create a completely random spot in the layout. And then lastly, we'll do a collision. So if our player is in a collision with another object, and that object is a monster, then we do a player destroy. Yep, and that destroys the player. Yep, so that's how we lose. So let's take a look. So I, we can shoot. I can move around. I've got my score a little off, so I need to fix that. But I just ran into a monster and died. So let me take a look at the score. Let's move that over here and run that again. So as I shoot, my score goes up, and I should have made that a little prettier. Um, but that's basically it. That's the top-down shooter, yep. um, which is what the introductory um, introductory demo is. We'll get some more features and stuff in part two. So in module one, we covered an introduction to making games, yep. why I do it, how to do it, how to make some money, right? Um, we did an introduction to Construct 2, downloaded it from the store, um, got to play around with it a little bit, and then we did our top-down shooter. So we will be, we're going to take a 10 minute break and we'll be back in 10 minutes for module two where we're going to add some, like I said, some, some features to our games and we'll see you guys back in 10. All right. Thanks everyone. Hey guys, and welcome back. We had a few minutes to, to stretch our legs and, and get ready for part two here. Uh, James Quick here again with I'm my Shahed. partner. Yep, uh, so we're here back for module two where we're gonna work on expanding your game. So we did in part one, we did the first hands-on demo. Now we're gonna get a little deeper, add some more features and get closer to a, a real finished game that we can take. And then in part four, you'll show us how to publish and ex or export and publish to the Windows platform. Yep, and that way you can get your game out there for others to play. Exactly. All right. So um, this, we're just going to jump right into it. This, um, this module will be basically all demo. We, uh, we did a lot of talking. We had a lot of intro stuff about 
making games and how to download Construct 2 and stuff. But now we're just basically going to dive in and just kind of stick in Construct 2 for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Yep. So the demo is going to be a game called Golden Ball, which I actually came up with myself um, and actually published to the store. I think you actually played it before. I have, yeah. Hopefully it was I'm, a I'm not very good enticing. at it, but I try. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll provide some links later on so you guys out there can check it out and go download it. But we'll walk through the majority of the features here today. Yep. So in, in this module, like I said, it's all going to be hands-on demo. We will work on adding more behaviors to our game. We'll work with functions. If you're a programmer, you know what functions are. If you're not, you'll quickly become acquainted with them. Uh, we're going to work on adding additional layouts, so a start screen, an end screen, and a game screen, that sort of thing. We will use permanent storage to keep track of things like high score. So if you play the game, close it out and come back, you still have your high score there. We'll do a little bit with image frames and animations. So we talked earlier that this is not a 3D tool by any means, yep. but you can do animations and image frames and kind of switch between them. It's kind of like a flip book to do animation, right? Right. And the last thing we'll do is we'll add a mute button just in case you have some sound in your game and people want to play it somewhere quiet on the plane or something. You can add a mute button to where no sound comes out, right? Yeah, we, we did mention more behaviors in this case. Uh, so uh, in the first module, just to recap, a behavior is something you add onto an object. Yep. So let's say you want a player to behave a certain way. You want an explosion to fade away when it's created. Uh, behaviors is where it's at. And uh, at the bottom, we have image frames and animations. Uh, so right now, when we added one graphic uh, for the explosion or the monster or the person, uh, we added one image frame, and we'll see how to add multiple frames of animation. Yep, and I think you'll have an even deeper example later on with cycling through an animation. Yep. Um, so yeah, we'll see all that. Uh, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Sure. So first off, what is the actual game? What is Golden Ball? It's a, a platformer game with turrets. So it's, it's a platform game but it's got a little twist. It's got turrets that are shooting at you. So the goal here is to, you can see it on the screen, the little player, and these are graphics that I created myself, so that's, that's about as good as it gets for me. But uh, the player jumps around on these platforms. The turrets at the bottom left and right are shooting at him, and he's dodging these bullets that are coming out, while at the same time trying to catch these balls that come down from the sky, basically. Yep. Um, so the different objects that we'll have in the game, we'll have our player, of course. We'll have the platforms that he will jump around and maneuver on. We'll have a background. We'll have the turrets that are shooting. Then we'll have the bullets that the turret is shooting. And we'll have some text and touch some of the, some of the invisible objects that we talked about before. Yep. Right. So the first part is going to be more behaviors. Again, behaviors are kind of predefined logic for your objects. So we talked about before the bullet behavior, which is basically constant motion. It will have something move with constant motion. We talked about the uh, bound to layout uh, behavior, which keeps my, my object or my player, whatever it is, inside of the layout that we're in. Yep. And we, we use several others, but we're actually gonna add on top of that and use some more. We won't, there's so many, we won't cover them all. Um, so you'll still have plenty of time to go out and explore yourself, but we'll cover a good chunk of them today. Right, and we'll talk about where you can get all these tutorials online uh, from our blog and also from the main Zero website and also in our Facebook group. We'll provide links to everything. Yep. Cool. So what behaviors are we going to use here? For the player object, we're gonna use the platform behavior. And this gets a little tricky because we also have a platform object. But the platform behavior basically turns um, our player into like a typical platformer player. So when he lands on a solid object, he will land. He can use the left and arrow, left and right arrow keys to move left and right. He can use the up arrow to jump. Uh, basically what you would expect from a typical platformer game, it gives him all of those uh, behaviors or qualities in the behavior. And we don't have to, to do any of that logic ourselves. So that's right. really, really handy and a great way to get started if you're doing a platformer game. And those of you who are wondering if Construct 2 provides touch and tilt controls as well, it does. Mm -hmm. uh, through the touch objects, you can uh, figure out whether someone's uh, tilting forwards or to the side as well. Yep. Um, so in addition to the platform, we'll also use wrap. So my favorite example of this is Doodle Jump, which uses the, the gyroscope, I guess, to yep. tilt left and right. And if you go out the right side, you'll actually pop back in from the left. So that's what wrap means. Uh, like Pac-Man also is a good example. Uh, most people have played Pac-Man at some point in their life. So if you go out, the right side of the screen, you'll come back in the left and vice versa. Now the, the platform object, and again, this gets a little confusing name-wise because you have the platform behavior and then you have the platform object. The platform object is the thing that, 
the player actually walks on, it jumps up and down onto, and lands on. So we're going to use the jump through behavior, and the jump through behavior allows a platform, uh, an object with platform behavior, so our player, again, it gets a little tricky, to land on that platform, but also jump from the bottom and through to the top if they want to do it that way too. Yep. Uh, we will also use the physics behavior, so there's a, a basically a built-in physics engine, which is pretty cool. Uh, we'll use that, and then we'll use a sign behavior that moves the... You can do oscillations for your objects, so it'll have the platform. Think of a pendulum swing. Right. So if you have a pendulum moving left and right, now take the pendulum out of the picture, and you have a platform moving left and right. Exactly. So with our turret object, uh, I mentioned that in the game it will be tracking the player, it will be shooting bullets at the player. Well, the turret behavior basically takes care of the majority of that for us. So we yep. need to add a little bit of logic in the back end to make it work. But for the most part, it takes care of all that with just adding that behavior, which again, awesome stuff. The more that Construct 2 can do for you, the better, right? Yes. And then lastly, the ball will have physics. So we'll create a ball at the top of the game and gravity physics will pull it down. It'll land on the platforms and it'll kind of bounce left and right. So let's go ahead. I've got open a project of Golden Ball. So this is basically my starter project. This is where we're going to start. And what I have here, I've got several different objects, but basically you see my player, the turrets at the bottom, the platforms throughout here, and then like we did at the end of part one, we've got some text objects here that display score and time. All right, and then uh, there's the ball at the top that is hidden initially, and then the bullet, just like we did before, is hidden because we don't want to see it until those turrets start shooting. Yep. And... Then in our game event sheet, I've got a couple of things. So we talked about, we had a global score, or global variable before for high score. So we've got, a, or for regular score, not high score. We'll talk about that separately. Um, but the score here is gonna start out at zero. I have a ball spawn rate, which basically just tells me how often I wanna spawn a ball at the top of the game so it falls down and I can go catch it and earn points. And then the timer uh, is set initially to 15. You could set it to whatever you want it to be. So all we're doing here is we're saying on the start of the layout, I want to reset my global variable. So each time I restart the game, I want to reset those global variables to the, their initial values. Right. And then I want to set the, let me open this up so we can take a look. So the, the timer text, the text object that holds the time, we want to go in and set its text to the string time, colon and space and then tack on the timer variable. So as it decreases, it shows time 15, time 14, time whatever. And how does that timer value change? Yeah, so the timer value is changing in the every one second. So this is an every X seconds, and then we give it an interval of one. And inside of there, we're sub or adding negative one to the timer. You could subtract one from the timer. Either way, it's the same thing. Yep. And then we're updating that text. So every time we change the timer variable, we'll update the text to say timer 15, timer 14, timer 13, down to zero. And then um, I actually have an action in here that we were testing with earlier that I don't need right now, so I'll delete that one. And we'll use that later, just playing a, a jump sound for every time that we jump. All right, what's another option to uh, disable something temporarily if you want to delete it, but you sort of want to keep it around? Yeah, so let me... Um, let me undo, and you can use Control Z just like you're used to to undo in Word or Visual Studio or something like that. Yep. And so instead of actually deleting this, if I just want to kind of temporarily get rid of it, there's a toggle disabled. Is that yep. what we were talking about? That's exactly what I was looking for. Right. So I can toggle disabled, and you'll see that a line goes through it, which means it won't be executed. Yep. But I, I really don't need that here, so I'm going to go ahead and delete it. Sure. <laughs> just a mistake on my part. So. Um, so the first thing we talked about in the slides, we're adding the behaviors, right? So we talked about several different ones. Let's go ahead and add those behaviors to our objects. All right. And just to refresh myself, for our player, we want the platform behavior and the rat behavior. So let's go back over to our game, and I'll select player, click behaviors, and click the plus mark, and then search platform, and also wrap. So again, platform gives it the ability to land on platforms, move left and right, and the wrap will wrap it. If it goes out the right side, it comes back in the left. Yep. And then for our platform, let's do behaviors. We, I mentioned that we were gonna use the jump through behavior, 
Let me do one thing very quickly, and let's do the solid behavior instead, and I'll kind of talk about what the difference is there. So if I run this game right now, I should be able to move left and right, jump up and down, and land on top of this object, this right. platform. But if I try to jump from the bottom, as you can see, I don't go through. So that's with the solid behavior. If I come back over and change the solid behavior and actually delete it, yeah, delete that, and then use the jump through, okay. And I'm gonna take my player also, where is he, player, and I'm gonna let him jump a little higher. So I'll set his jump strength to 800, so he can jump a little higher. But now with the jump through behavior, I can jump from the bottom and go through the platform up to the top. All right. So now you can do any combination of those two. You can have some of the, some platforms use solid, some use um, jump through. Mm -hmm. Either way is fine, and it just kind of depends on how you want your game to feel and, and act. But two pretty quick and easy ways to get this platformer game started. And I've seen games use different kinds of graphics for that. So let's say if it's a jump through, you have a visual platform that indicate that you can jump through it. And if it's something solid, maybe it's made of rock or stone yeah. that you can't, can't go through it. Exactly. And you could do you could do different colors, red versus blue or something. You could do whatever you want, yep. any combination of, of all of the above. Exactly. So back to the slides. Uh, so we have a couple more we need to add in addition to the jump through. We need to add the physics behavior and the sign behavior. So let's go back over to our game and we'll come down and select platform and then go into behaviors. And again, we want physics. So we'll add that one, and then the sign behavior, S-I-N-E, okay. Now let me run this again, and we should see that these platforms are now moving back and forth, right? So they're oscillating all at the same, um, all the same speed, the same distance, that sort of thing. So I can come in to the properties for platform, and if I select platform in the objects pane, it changes, anything I change will change to all of them, right? right? Uh, but some of the variables we can play with here are under sign, we can change the period and we can change it to two. And I think that makes it a little faster. I'll have to make sure. And then magnitude, we could change it to 75 or something. And now we should see that these will oscillate a little faster and a little wider. Right. In addition, if I come out and select just one platform, if I can, select one platform, I can go in and change some of his variables. So I'll do a period of five and have him move really slow and a low <coughs> magnitude. Now I should see this one down at the bottom moves very differently than the rest. So you can change the behaviors, the properties of the behaviors as a whole, or you can kind of dig in and change them individually so that they act a little different and you don't know exactly what to expect at all times, right? Adds a little bit of excitement to your game. So let's pop back over to the slides. And now for the turret object, we want to do the turret behavior. And let's go over back to the game. We'll select the turret. We've got two, the bottom left and bottom right. And we'll do behaviors and select turret behavior. And that looks good. And we'll see a couple things in here that we'll need to change. The range is basically what distance can it see? So right now it's only looking 300 pixels away to be able to see its target. And our screen is a lot bigger than 300 pixels. So I'm gonna just bump this up to 3000 so we can always see the target, the player. The rate of fire, and this is the time to shoot in seconds. I would have thought, um, I would have thought that this was how many times per second you shoot, but it's actually the amount of time it takes to shoot. So this is saying I'm shooting every one second. So it's very customizable. Right? Yeah, you can come in and edit all these properties just like you can for any of the other objects. Cool. And then I think that's all the, that's all the properties there that we have to change. So now let's come back over. And we've got one last behavior for the ball, which is just physics. And we're going to see something a little awkward here that I'll have to fix. But let's go into the ball. And we want to add physics. And remember, we added physics to the platform object as well. So... We'll see something a little goofy here. When this ball falls, it's going to hit that platform and it's going to make it start spinning. That's, that's what physics does. Now it's, now it's just spinning and rotating and the player looks a little weird jumping on the spinning platform. So what we want to do is for the platforms, 
we want to keep them in place so that when anything hits it, it doesn't move itself. So we want to say that it's immovable. And now if we run again, the ball will fall down and it kind of bounces around and it'll follow, um, it'll slide around on the platforms as it moves around and it's a little more what we expect, I think, right? Instead of yep. the spinning platforms. And if you wanted to have a spinning platform, you could still click individual platforms to do that. You could, yeah, so that's a good point. We, we talked about changing the, how far it oscillates and how quickly it oscillates. You can change any of the properties for individual instances rather than changing it for all of the instances of one object, exactly. So I think we've got, let me make sure we've got all the behaviors covered there. I think we've got all those covered. So now let's go over to functions. All right. And what functions are, again, if you're a programmer, you know what this is, it's nothing new. But functions is a way to um, help you organize your events and avoid having to duplicate groups of actions or events. So if you're repeating, if you're saying do this, 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 and then down here you say do this, 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 well a function will allow you to put all that stuff down here and then just say call this function and it'll do the rest for you. So basically a set of instructions where you don't have to repeat the instructions every time, but you right. can just call it uh, with one name. Exactly. So it's really good for reusable logic. Some questions to ask yourself and whether or not you should be using functions. Well, the main question here is basically, are you repeating the same events and actions over and over again, right? As a, a programmers are very efficiently lazy, I guess is how you can say it. And they, they don't want to repeat anything that they don't have to. So the less redundant they can be, the better. And right. that's, how, that's where functions come in and kind of help with that. So for you programmers out there, again, you're familiar with functions. You can do things such as return values. You can have parameters. And you can do nesting and recursion just like you're used to with any programming language. Yep. So very powerful. And before, before we do the functions, we need to add a little bit of the logic to our game. So right now, uh, let's see. The first thing we want to do, we can increase our score. So anytime that our player collides with the ball, we can increase that score, right? So let's do an event and let's say player on collision with another object and we'll choose the ball and say done. And then we want to do a system add two and we'll add to the score variable. We'll add one there. And then after adding one, we also want to update that text that displays the score on the screen, right? Yep. So let's see, uh, we've got a not timer text, but score text somewhere. Score text. There we go. And then set text. And we talked about this in module one, but we want to display the word score with a colon and a space. And then we'll tack on the score variable. Yep. And then also we want to delete the or destroy the ball. So after we catch it, we get to keep it. It's destroyed. So we'll do a ball and destroy. If I can spell correctly. So let's run again, and I catch a ball, I get a point, and I haven't added the logic to create more falling uh, golden balls. So that's the next thing we can do, right? We can say uh, system, and then every, oh, every x seconds, and then we can choose that variable that we have, the ball spawn rate, which is two, so it's gonna say every two seconds, and then I want to, do a system create object and create a ball object on, let's see, what layer are we in? I think it's layer one. At a, we can do a random x coordinate again between zero and layout width. And then we can do the y coordinate to negative 10 so it doesn't just spawn right at the top and come down. It'll spawn a little bit higher. Yep. Right. All right. So. Now let's take another look. And we should see, we'll catch the first one, and then we'll see another ball fall, we can catch that one. And I can sit here and play all day long. <laughs> <laughs> so we haven't added um, much difficulty yet, right? So how, what, what, what can we add to make this a little more difficult? Well, there are a couple of turrets sitting right there. Uh, maybe they could make themselves useful. Yeah, so these turrets, uh, we talked about by design, these should be shooting at our player, right? right. That's what the turret behavior does for us. So let's go ahead and set that up while our game We've got infinite, infinite golden balls coming down. But let's switch back over to the game. And let's add the logic for the turret behavior. Yep. 
So what you want to do with the turret behavior is you want to say on the start of the layout, when this game starts, you want to set the target for that turret so that it, throughout the game, it follows and rotates to aim towards that target. The target in this case is our player. So we've already got an on start of layout event, so let's just add an action there. And we can go to turret, and then under the actions for turret, you can do acquire target, and choose target, and we'll do player, and say done. So now it's locked into our target. Now we need to actually do the logic that does the shooting. So the turret has an event called on shoot, and based on, let's go back over to the layout and select the turret, based on its properties, there's the rate of fire. Based on that property, it will shoot accordingly, how often it's supposed to. Right. So let's go back over and let's say that turret, and then there's the on shoot event. So every time that on shoot is triggered, we want to have the turret spawn another object, and we want to spawn a bullet object on layer one. Did we add the bullet behavior to the bullet object? Uh, we may have. Uh, so the quickest way to check that, as you've shown us before, is just right-click on the bullet behavior or bullet object. Yep, I forgot that. So we need to we need to go in and update that behavior for bullet. Yep. And there it is. So now let's take a look again at our game. And these are shooting bullets at us. We haven't added any logic where we die if we get hit or anything. But they're constantly shooting at us. If I move, the bullets follow me. They aim accordingly. And then we see one kind of awkward thing is that the bullets seem to be coming out of the middle of the turret, and we had that problem in part one. Yep, and that was the image point where by default it's in the center of the graphic. Yeah, exactly. With the sprites, it's in the center. And with tile backgrounds, it's the top left. Yep. Right. So let's, uh, let's make that change really quickly. Let's go into the turret. If I can double click there. And we'll add another image point, and we'll just do it right at the tip and press enter. And now when we create that bullet, we want to put it at image point one of the turret. Yep. So we'll run one more time and we should see it look a little more natural. The bullets are coming out of the tip of the turret. Right. So the next piece of logic we want to add is how do we lose? Right. Right. Uh, so right now you have inf seem to have infinite lives, or you never get hit. You have invincibility here, <laughs> which could be a game in itself, but right. we probably want to make it more insightful uh, for the user to to try not to die. Yep. So what should we do for that? Uh, maybe uh, detect some collision there and have the uh, person being destroyed as soon as they get hit. Yep. So the collisions will be the bullet. Um, I'm going to do if you hit the the turret. Also, you're gonna you're gonna die. And then if the time gets down to zero or below, then we'll, we'll uh, lose as well. And for now, what we'll do is we'll just restart the game. So we won't, we could destroy uh, the player, but for now we'll just restart. So let's add those three events. So it's player on collision with another object and one could be a bullet. Okay. And then add event player on collision with turret. And then also we can do a system compare variable and if timer is less than or equal to zero, then we'll do the same thing. Yep. So we don't want it to go into the negative. Right, and it actually would. If I, if I ran it right now for more than 15 seconds, it would negative one, negative two, it would keep going. Right. And in each one of these, we want to just restart our layout. So we'll come in and we'll add an action and we'll do a system restart layout, okay? And then I can actually copy and paste, so if I control C and then click on the event and then control V, it'll copy and paste that event down. And for those of you who've noticed, we've now repeated a couple of things, so that's a great way to remember that things like functions will help you uh, take care of repeated actions. Right, so this is exactly where functions come in. So if you, we're basically repeating the same exact thing. Now this is a very simple example because we're only doing one thing, we're only restarting the layout, but let's say in the future, we, we need to keep track of the score, update the high score, and then go um, and restart the layout. So we'll have multiple steps that we would be repeating. That's why we'll use functions. Yep. So let's go ahead. That's a good point. We can go ahead and do that now. So the first thing we need to do is add an event for our function. So we'll come in, we'll choose the function object. And again, this is one of those um, invisible objects that we add to the game. So it's just a double click 
add function. Yep. And then you can use it through any layout and event sheet. So it'll be on function, and then we'll give it the name of the function, and I'll call it lose event. So this is what we'll call whenever we lose. And in the, I'm going to just copy the system restart and paste it down there. And then instead of calling system restart in each of those three different places, we will come in and change that to function and call function, and we'll call the lose event function. Yep. And a great way to replace an existing uh, action is to just double click on it or right click uh, where you have several options to replace. Yep. So I can double click, restart layout, and go back, function, call function, and then type in lose event. Or I could copy this, paste it down, and then delete the restart. Yep. Either way. So you'll, you'll get more familiar the more you do it and the more you play around with construct. Um, so now let's take a look. If I just stand here and one of these bullets will hit me, now the game restarts and my score variable restarts as well as my time. And the same thing would happen if I got down to zero uh, time or if I came over and hit the turret, I lose as well. So I think, I think that's all the logic we need to add for now to take advantage of the function. So now let's move over to additional layouts. So we've only got one screen here, but typically in a game, you'll have basically a start screen, a game screen that we already have, and then an end screen, and then I'll actually add an about page as well. So these are the different layouts that we'll add to, to our game to make it a little more compelling, right? Yep. And so some questions you might ask yourself, do you want a home screen? Do you want an about page? Do you want extra levels? So you could have level one, level two, level three, and kind of go between them. Very popular model for, for different games. The basic idea that we'll do here is to have a home screen, a game screen, an end screen, and then an about page. Um, once we create additional layouts, you can either create another corresponding event sheet that goes with it, or you can reuse an older event sheet, but we'll just create new event sheets with each layout that we create. So again, we want to start at the home screen, which is shown on the screen right now. Press play, go to game, lose, you go to the end screen, and then you can either restart the game or go back home. Pretty straightforward. And then from the start screen, you also have a button for about. So let's go ahead and start to add those. And I think I've still got my game running. Let me close that out. There we go. So to add a layout, you can come over to the projects tab, right click layouts and add layout. And we want to add a corresponding event sheet, also the logic for that, um, that layout. So I'll call this start layout. Actually, I made one mistake. Let me undo that. And th again, this is just control Z. Since I already have the look and feel of this game layout, I want to, I want to replicate that look and feel. So instead of creating a new layout from scratch, I'm just going to replicate or duplicate that game layout and call it start layout. and then open up Start Layout and zoom out a little bit, if I can. There we go. And I'm going to get rid of, um, so I don't want to display, or I will want to display score eventually. I don't want to have the time there. I don't want to have these platforms there, so I'll delete those. So while you're deleting that, I just wanted to mention that there are multiple ways to zoom out. Uh, you could use uh, Control plus or minus. Uh, on your uh, keyboard, or you can use control on your keyboard using the scroll wheel on your mouse, and that works too. Yep. I don't, I don't know why it stuck for me for a second, but yeah, two, two different ways. Uh, with a lot of things, there's different ways to do, yep. uh, do things, and it's just kind of whatever you're familiar with. Exactly. Um, but I've got this down to the basic page that I want to start with. I've already defined some text objects, so the first one I'll do, I'll drag in a title text, which is just the title of the game, so I'll put it up here. It says Golden Ball. I'll go and jump or excuse me, grab the play button. Uh, it's a text object. I just name it as a button because when I click it, I'll go to the, to the play screen. Yep. And then I'll go in and grab the about button as well. That'll take me to the about page. So that's a basic layout for our start page. Then we need to have the event sheet. So I'll right click event sheet, add event sheet, and call it start event sheet. Now just to make sure that these two are connected, if you select the start layout, you can go in and change the corresponding event sheet to the start event sheet. Yep. Pretty straightforward. So by default, when you create a new layout, it generates an event sheet and attaches it to it. But as you've seen right now, we can create them individually and manually and manually reattach them. Yep, exactly. 
So let me X those out and then I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna duplicate the start layout for the end layout. And let me open that up. And the end layout will still display the high score. So I'll leave that score there. Let me zoom in a couple more. I can get rid of the about button and then I can leave the golden ball title there, but I'll delete the play button and I'll add a, what did I call them? A restart button. Let's see what I called them. I've got a home button that'll take me back home. And then I can actually just reuse the play button that I've already created. Yep. So I'll go and grab the play button. And then I can go in and add the logic for that navigation. And actually, I'll go ahead and do that. So I'll create the an event sheet, add event sheet, and do end event sheet. All right. And then I'll make sure that the end layout is using the end event sheet. So I'll come in, change the event sheet to end event sheet. That looks good. And then I'll just say, I've already added the, the invisible touch object. So I'll say touch on touched object. So on the play button, I will do a system go to layout and then I'll choose the start layout and do a touch on touched object and do the, let's see, the home layout. I will, oh, I got these a little mixed up. The home button will take me, go to, that'll take me to the start screen and then the play button will take me back to the to the game page. That's right. And uh, just by looking at uh, these actions, you can see that Construct 2 makes it super easy to go back and change things around when you need to. Right, yeah, so you can go back and change anything, just kind of double click, open it, and change some of the parameters or change it completely around. Right. Even the naming of everything. For example, you have something called play button, you have something called home button. Uh, it lets you see what you're actually building. Uh, by default, it gives you some names where you could actually leave it with the default names, but because you've renamed everything, it's easy to point out uh, which ones uh, have specific functionalities. Exactly. Yeah, very, very, very straightforward. They try to be very descriptive with their names, and so they're, they're pretty easy to guess what they do. Yep. Right. Uh, let, me, let me go back and open up the start event sheet, and let's do the same thing here that we just did. So we want to do the touch on touch object. And then when we touch the play button, we can go to the game. And then now we need to go in and we'll duplicate the start screen and call it about layout. And we can come in and add an event sheet for about. And then make sure that this about layout again is using the about event sheet. And now let's go in and edit the about layout here. So we don't need the about button, obviously, because this is the about page. We can take off the score and we'll replace that with the home button. Let's drag that in. And then I've got, instead of the play button, I've got a description and it's called about text. And so this just says collect as many golden balls as 30 seconds as possible and tells you about the game. And then I'll come in and I'll add a couple of buttons to go to my Twitter. So I'll add that in there and then my blog as well. Right, and that's one thing to notice here that you can actually add links to actual websites or yep. any URL. And this reminds you that Construct 2 is running within either a browser or a browser platform, uh, but it always has access to a browser to get on the internet. So if you're running on any device or a computer, uh, you can add these links to your website. Exactly, and what we the object that we need to do that is the browser object that I've already added in here. Yep, and that's one of those invisible objects you mentioned. Yeah, another invisible object, exactly. So in the about event sheet, we want to set the logic, the navigation for those three buttons, the home, Twitter, and blog. Right? Yep. So we'll do the touch, and on touch object, we'll do the home button, and we will go to the start page. And then now, when we touch the Twitter, oh, on touch object, when we do the Twitter text, we'll use the browser, browser, and we'll do go to URL. Yep. And then we just type in a URL here. So it'll be www.twitter.com slash J, yeah, 
J Quick Wit. That look good. Yep, looks good. Okay, and then we'll do basically the same thing or a similar thing for the blog. So when we touch the blog text, we can do a browser, a go to, and we'll do, a, so it's blogs.msdn.com slash quick, and here's the underscore that we talked about in the beginning, quick yeah. underscore thoughts. So I think, does that handle all the navigation? I think for testing, let me do, let me set this timer variable. I'll just set it to three so we can test pretty quickly. So let's run, so we got a lot of stuff going on. So let's select the start layout, let's run it. And we can go to the about page. Oh, I haven't set that one yet. Oh, we, we did miss one of them. So if you can click play while you're here, we'll know if that one's set, there you go. Play works and then we should Oh, we still have, we didn't change the, the losing event to go to the end page. So we got yep. a couple of things we got to fix. So let's see. In the start event sheet, we need to add to go to the about page. So touch on touched object and about button. And when we do that, we'll go to about page. And then in the, and let me close out some of these so we can get some more room on here. It's kind of claustrophobic right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the game event sheet, instead of changing restart layout three times in the, in the function that we have, we can just change it here and do a go to layout to the end, end layout. Yep. And now I need to select start layout again to run from start. So let's say this is our start screen. We can go to the about page and we'll see the description. We can click on blog. It'll actually go out to my blog. There it is. I can click on about in Twitter. It'll go out to my Twitter page. There we go. So that's it behind there. That's me. And then we can click play. And we can play the game. When we lose, we go to the end page. We can play again. If we lose, we can go home. So we have all the navigation between the layouts taken care of. Yep. Right? I think that takes care of all the events. Yep. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. So you can do, uh, I mean, that's the basic structure of a game. You have a title screen, a game page and then maybe an about page. You can do all of that within Construct 2. Right. So when the game starts, I notice that everything just restarts itself. How do you save sessions or uh, store anything? Yeah. So good point. We talked about wanting to maintain your score. So let's say you, you get a score and then you, you exit out of your game. You want that high score to still be there. Yep. So that's where we talk about permanent storage. And what permanent storage is, it allows you to store things for more time than just while you're in the browser. So you can close out the browser or the app and come back to it and it's still there. So the web storage object can store data locally on the user's computer between sessions. Uh, there's a lot of words on here, but what that means is you can store it, you can close your browser, you can close your app, you can come back to it, and it's still there. Yep. Pretty straightforward. And for web developers out there, you may have used something called HTML5 storage. Uh, so that's ex essentially what it is. Since it's using HTML5 and JavaScript under the covers, uh, it's setting up HTML5 storage within the browser itself. Yep, exactly. So ways to use it, high scores, achievements, what current level the user's on, stuff like that. How does it work? If you're a programmer, you're probably familiar with a dictionary with key value pairs. You basically store a name and then a value. So a name is high score, and then the value is whatever value you give it, right? Yep. The basic idea here to use this is to check to see if a given key exists. If it does, uh, use it. If it doesn't, then create it so it's initialized. Right. And I think, all right, so let's go ahead and do that. So I've already added the web storage object. Again, one of those invisible objects that come in really handy. And let's go to the start event sheet. And let's say on the start of the layout, so on start, oh, under system first, system on start of layout. Let's add, and this is the first time we'll do this, let's add a sub event, just another event underneath that first event. And we'll do web storage, and we'll say local key exists. We'll check to see if local key exists. And we'll do NVA high score. And then if it exists, we want to, let's see, we want to go in and set the score text that we're using, because we still have that score text there. We want to set the score text, its text, to not score, but high score. Right. 
And it's yeah. important to note that uh, you just added a sub-event, which is different from adding a separate event. So if you look at the way it's indented, four is indented yep. underneath three. Exactly, and that's exactly how it would be in programming. You would yep. indent according to whichever function you're in or something like that. Yep. So we want to tack on, we want to say high score and then tack on the web storage value. So we'll do web storage and then a dot and then local value. Scroll down a little bit, local value. And then we needed to give it a parameter of what value we're looking for or what key we're comparing to get the value from. And that key is going to be MVA high score. That look right. So now what if it doesn't exist? We, we, we have if it exists, what if it doesn't? Then we can right click on that event and add an else. Yep. So it's saying if that key exists, set the text. If not, now what do we want to do? And we want to, if it doesn't exist, we want to go out and create it. So web storage, set local value, and we'll set the MVA high, is it all one word that I do? I think so, yes. Let me double check. Uh, MVA high score, yep, all one word, high score. And we'll set it initially to zero because that means they're opening it for the first time. Yep, so the spelling here is important. If you spell something differently, uh, it refers to a different variable. So it's important to note that whatever variable name you choose, it doesn't matter what it is. But once you set it, uh, try to remember what you use or just go back and take a look at it. Exactly. Um, so if, if we set it, then we want to update our score text as well. And we'll say score text, set text. And we'll set it to high score. And we'll tack on a zero right now. Or we could go in and get the updated value, but we know we just set it to zero. Yep. Right. So that should take care of high score there. Now, how do we save the high score? Because we've initialized that we have that value stored, the key value stored, but how do we save it? And that's going to be in our game event sheet on the lose event. So here's where we can add some additional logic just once, and then it gets triggered every time it calls that function. So let's go in and let's say on the lose event, let's add a sub event. And let's compare, let's do a system compare two values and let's compare the score. If score, current score in the game is greater than the web storage dot local value. And then we'll give it the key MVA high score. So we're saying if our current score is greater than the stored score, if that happens, we want to, let me make this a little bigger. And that's important because you don't want to replace the score no matter what the person gets. Right, you only higher. want to replace if, you, if you've earned it, right? Yep, you okay. got to work hard to get these high scores. Right. Um, so now we'll go in and update. So web storage dot set local value, and we'll set MVA high score to the score variable. Yep. Um, but what we're doing right now is we're executing this end layout go to end layout first, but we want to do that after all of this. So we can actually come into lose event and add a blank sub event. Oh, add a blank sub event. Where is that? Add blank sub event and drag this end layout down. Now it's saying when you call the lose layout, if your score is greater than the web storage score, update it. And then regardless of that, after that, go to the end layout. Right. And so let's, let's play this real quick. Let's play. Let me catch a ball. So I've got one, and I haven't updated the home screen or the end screen. So let's go home. Now high score is one. Yep. If I play again, let me see if I'm good enough to get two. I lost, or the, my timer is short. Um, but I go home. My high score is still there. I could close out the browser and come back. It's still there. Yep. Which is what we want. And that's an important key thing to uh, learn. When you're working on uh, web browser uh, storage, uh, it's attached to the browser itself. So let's say you go to someone else's computer uh, and you launch the same thing. Uh, in the same browser, or in a different browser, so to speak, uh, you'll notice that this high score is no longer there. So again, it's attached to the browser instance on a specific right, game. Right, but when we talk about games and yeah. apps, it'll be confined. You can't take that app and open it up on a different browser. It will, it, you'll be good right, exactly. on the uh -huh. game. Yep. So after permanent storage, we have image frames and animations. So we're going to do a pretty simple example here. We're just going to turn the character left to right, depending on which way he's moving. Right. Uh, it's going to be pretty straightforward. There's no 3D in Construct 2. We talked about that. Animation is possible with frames and, and animations and stuff. So let's go over to Construct, back to the, the game layout, select our player, and right click and edit animations. And I'm just going to take this one down here, copy, and paste it. I think I can do that. 
or duplicate, sorry, right click, duplicate. And then I'm gonna go in and edit the one that's here and do a mirror so that he's facing, um, he's facing left and that should populate down here. Uh, but now I've got two, open them back up, now I've got two images, one left and one right. And very simply, since I have the keyboard input, the keyboard object already added, in the game event sheet, I can say, uh, if I touch the keyboard and on key pressed, if I press the left arrow, okay, done, then I can do player set frame, and I'll set frame, which one was facing left? I believe it was zero. Okay, so zero is facing left, and then I'll do the similar thing for keyboard on key press, and then choose right, Yep. and done, and then I can copy this down here and change this to one, and now let's run one more time. And so, are my image points off there? Yep, so uh, when we add multiple frames to an animation, uh, each frame by default has uh, an image point right in the middle. Uh, so if you go to the second frame, you'll notice that your image point's still in the middle. Uh, and the first one, if you check the first one as well, they should both be towards the middle, right? So for some reason, your, uh, your graphic is falling to the bottom. And this is something that uh, you may experience if, you're, if you use the platform behavior. There we go. But somehow it's corrected itself. Well, I, I, I changed it a little bit, but you wanna make sure that the image points are the same. So now we flip in left and right. Okay, there you go. So the last thing we wanna do is add a mute button. So we need to go in and add some sound really quickly, and then we'll give you a way to take it off, take yep. the sound off. Um, pretty simple and kinda necessary if you wanna play somewhere that's quiet. Um, so pretty straightforward, what we're going to do, we're going to create a global variable that says, that's called muted. If it's zero, that means the game is not muted, that means you'll play music. And if it's set to one, that means it's muted, it will not play, not music, but sound effects. Yep. Right. And we haven't talked about this yet, but the audio object, another one of those invisible objects that come in really handy, it will allow us to play uh, media, and I've added a couple of sound effects in here under sounds for jump and shoot. So let's go to the game event sheet. And let's say when the turret shoots, I will do an audio and a play. And I'll play the shoot and I'll do not looping. And the volume zero, that just means that's the standard volume. Yep. And now we unplugged over here. Let me make sure my audio is up. Now we should be able to hear We've got some audio. So now, every time we shoot, we should hear that shooting sound. Try that again. So play, and so we can hear that, that pss, pss, pss yep, of the shooting. Yep, I hear that. Yep. Um, so now, instead of doing that, instead of uh, forcing it to play every time, and I have one for jump as well, but this will be enough. Let's go into the... Um, so we can add a mute button maybe to the page and have the user control yeah. that. Yep, so the start layout, we will go in and grab a mute button text and it will sit down here. And under the start event sheet, we can say, well, we need to create the global variable that goes along with it. Right? Yep. Um, so we will add a global variable called muted and initially it's set to zero. And then Let's see, where am I going? Uh, when we click on the, so on touched object, when we click on the mute button, we can change the text of it to say, so mute button set text, and we'll set it to muted or unmute. And then we can update that variable, the global variable, so mute button, or no, sorry, uh, system set value, and we'll set the muted variable to one. Yep. And let's see, so now if I click it, it goes to unmute, and I'll have to go back and say, uh, add a, a little bit of extra logic to say, if it is one when I click it, then do the opposite of what I just did. Yep. If it's zero when I click it, then do what I just did, right? Yep, that way it'll handle both cases. Yeah, that way it'll go, it'll toggle back and forth. And then we would do a check inside of the actual game to see if it's enabled, if it's not. 
And then one additional thing you could do um, is you could use that as web storage, just like we did for the for the high score in yep. web storage. So next that, time the person comes in, it'll remember whether it's muted or not. Right, so it'll save their preferences whether or not they want it to be um, muted or not, which is another thing you can use for web storage, is just preferences in general. Yep. So um, the finished example of Golden Ball you can find on the Windows 8 and Windows Phone store. I've got a bit.ly link here. It's pretty straightforward. W8 Golden Ball or WP8 Golden Ball. I encourage you to check it out, download it. You can compare to, to what you work on at home. Yep. And that's it for part two. So we, we did the, the golden ball demo. We walked through a bunch of extra features, behaviors, objects, stuff like that. And I think we're going to take another 10 minute break and come back in a few minutes and get ready for module three. Yep. And once you download the game, see if you can beat your high scores and just tweet it to James. Yeah. So yeah, let me know how you guys are doing on the high scores. We'll see you after the break. Yep.